the other four people, um, all, how many people do we have today? All, all 40 people who are in um, the group today, which is awesome. And then we're going to have another bunch of people here on YouTube in just a moment. And in case you hadn't figured this out, I'm rambling to kill time until they, until YouTube got launched. All right, now I can say good morning, happy Saturday, September 12th. Um, all there out there on YouTube. Um, I'm David Dorian Ross, the founder of the Virtual Pipe Club. This is the Virtual Pipe Club, and in a moment, I'm going to go to Gallery View, so you can see all the awesome folks here. We have a very special guest today. Um, I, I've given you a new, uh, Chris. Has anybody ever called you this before? I call the Bone Collector. I I don't think so. Thanks for having me, though. <laughs> That's your new nickname. Usually, usually it's Bonehead. It's Bonehead normally. <laughs> <laughs> so so the, the guys in the uh, the Bones group started. I don't know who. I mean, it was probably you know fire created on different continents at the same time. But a lot of people started saying it at the same time, and it just kind of stuck with you know the group. <laughs> So, well, we'll try to be more gentle uh, than that. Right. But um, in, in any case, we, we welcome you and, and are very grateful to uh, have you here. So Chris Morgan is the, uh, the founder of Chris Morgan Pipes, Chris Morgan Meats, and Morgan Forge, all kinds of things, which hopefully we'll get a chance to ask him to talk about today. And um, I'm going to turn off that spotlight and turn on Chris's spotlight. There we go. And, um, and say howdy. Hey. Um, I'm going to um, get things kicked off. But for those of you who might be new in the meeting or haven't been here a whole lot, um, at some point, we totally turn this over to Q&A. I am, I'm only here to sort of keep the ball rolling, uh, the, but the meeting is really about you guys and please feel free to ask any questions that you want to. We're staying away from a couple of topics today. We're not gonna talk about religion or politics. So if that's, um, you know, <laughs> the two things that are heavily on your mind these days, we'll, we'll just have to wait till after, we'll, we'll do it in the after meeting. Um, and also, go. did you guys see the little thing about the FDA deeming that I posted yesterday? Um, so yeah. that's that's the only thing we're talking about as regards to the FDA today, just just that. So those are the three things we're staying away from today. Everything else, including um, uh, Chris's uh, secret middle name and uh, and that kind of thing, those are all <laughs> free topics because he didn't mention those when I talked to him earlier. So. Mm -hmm. Now that I've said all that, why don't we start with something easy, like tell us your life story and, and how you got into uh, pipe carving. Okay. Uh, well, I, uh, there's, there's different versions of that story depending on, on uh, how you look at it. But basically, I'll give you the, the, the basic gist of it. I uh, originally went to uh, California University for marine biology. And uh, after, you know, getting through you know, some of the, the early classes. And then uh, I was actually taking college courses while I was in high school. Uh, they didn't count towards college credits, but they were sort of like a introductory to marine biology. And I, I mean, that caught my eye. I was super into it. Uh, but upon uh, maybe my second year at college, I kind of just ended up having a conversation with an actual marine biologist uh, and not just someone with a basic degree, but he had a doctorate. And, um, you know, we started talking more and he was like, yeah, I'm on basically a boat four to six months out of the year. Uh, and I was like, that's cool. You know, and then I started thinking that's not that cool. That sucks. You know, <laughs> you're, uh, you know, it depends on where you are, I guess. But, uh, then I started asking him what the pay was like and living in California, those of you that do, um, know that your uh, cost of living is going to be quite a bit higher. And uh, he ended up coming back and giving me a number. And I just said, there's no way I could live on that. I mean, it's just not possible, let alone have a family. I mean, there's, there's no way. And then, so I came back and I was like, you know what, that's, that's that. Came back basically, 
I wouldn't say fully empty handed, but wanted to uh, find something to do. I've always been artistic. I've always liked making things and tinkering and all those things. Uh, and then I, it hit me one day, my, my grandpa and my great grandfather used to smoke pipes, which I have their pipes in my collection. And I said, hey, I'll give this a shot. So I checked out the uh, Pimo, which is, well, it was uh, a company at one point. Now it is part of uh, Steve Norse's conglomerate of Vermont Freehand. He sort of absorbed it and kind of helped out the family and all that. Uh, bought some pre-drilled pipe kits. And that's where the first maybe three dozen, four dozen pipes came from. Um, and then after that, I started buying briar and um, hand hand cutting stems, and it just kind of went on from there. When you say that you had always liked making things, did, did you like do um, wood shop in school, or did you have a, a dad who taught you how to take a clock apart? I mean, like, what was that like? My well, I come from a lot of uh, carpenters in my family. Fine finished carpenters god my nose is so itchy all of a sudden um so my my both of my grandfathers were carpenters and home builders uh i kind of went off into the weeds and i ended up becoming sort of a uh we'll call it an amateur pro <laughs> ceramicist in high school um i actually uh was teaching ceramics to other students while i was attending the high school um and that was mainly because the my teacher basically had other things to do and she said you take care of these guys um and that was cool that was a fun position of power you know when you're you know 16 17 years old and you're like actually teaching a class and not getting paid for it of course but <laughs> um but ceramics was my gig and and i got to the point where i started it it, it actually formed the way that i uh, my ethos, you know, the kind of the way that I would do business. I mean, I, I put, um, I would put dozens of hours into a piece to the point where the piece became so uh, hypothetically expensive that you could never sell it for a profit. I mean, it was, there were so many hours involved. So whenever I had someone check out my work and they really liked it, I would just give it to them. Um, and uh, it, it kind of, like I said, kind of formed the way that I think about my pipes. I mean, when I was doing handmade pipes, uh, I went full time uh, 12, 12 years ago, I think, doing this. I've been doing it for about almost 15, been smoking a pipe for 25 years, 20, 25, somewhere in there. Um, and I started kind of not, it was sort of damned the, the time cost when I would do these pipes. I mean, there, there's some pipes that I have literally hundreds of hours into. And even at minimum wage, you know, there's there's no way you're making any money on it. So um, yeah, that's that's kind of where I come from. I mean, it, the tinkering and all that, I have a, a great pride about myself that there's literally nothing that I cannot fix. That's kind of the one thing, my claim to fame that I really enjoy. Like. You bring me something that's broken, I'll figure out how to fix it. Building it is another thing. I mean, you, you say build a doghouse, I'm screwed. But <laughs> going to fix I, a doghouse, I'll fix it. <laughs> yeah. Somebody, somebody I, bring him a, a broken doghouse and we're, we're good to go. Yeah. Um, I feel I, you will be getting a lot of letters from people with a broken marriage. Like, Chris, yeah. you <laughs> promised me you could fix this. I have fixed. I have fixed a few, but don't, don't put me on that. <laughs> I, I might ask for your number later, Chris. Okay, <laughs> I'll do what yeah. I can. Martin, and Martin, you're always free Martin, to invoke the every weekend amendment. when he spends too much time here. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'm curious if I could follow up a little bit about your ceramics work and how you say that framed your ethos. So mm -hmm. you've given us a sense of like, you know, diving into the creative process. But is there something stylistic that you got from your ceramics that has gone into your pipes? Well, ceramics are kind of formless, you know, there's, there's really, uh, there's, there's nothing holding uh, any constraint. You, you can make anything out of ceramics, you know, barring gravity, gravity is a pain in the ass with ceramics. And that's just something that you have to get used to. Um, and there's ways to 
combat that and and i've seen some insane things made over the years now i don't i don't really do it anymore because um my shop is mainly a metal shop at the moment i basically turned everything around it's a prototyping shop for future projects for knife making for traditional blacksmithing uh fabrication all kinds of stuff i kind of built it around a, a different point but uh i can't really have ceramic water you know crap everywhere because if you've ever seen a ceramicist studio uh they are messy and there's it, everything's rusty anything metal is going to be rusty because it's just there's water everywhere um so someday i'll get back into it but it kind of when you come from a formless art uh mixed media uh, painting anything like that um it it helps you become a better artist in in a, a tangible format like like pipe making something that you know it has to be beautiful but it also has to work so there's always been a, a marriage of, of two sides the the engineer which is a very weak part of of my skill set i'm definitely not an engineer but there are basics and then you basically wrap that in beauty or controversiality or, or whatever you want to frame that piece as uh, you, you put that into you, you wrap that around your your uh, your engineering um, and that's the same with ceramics I mean you can make the craziest wild teapot but that thing is still going to pour water and that's it like it's, it doesn't have to perform anything any crazy function so that's kind of why I like in the two and it, it there's, there's really, there was no future for me in ceramics because, you know, no one is going to spend, you know, a hundred dollars for a dinner plate. Um, and you can get a, an insanely high quality teapot from Japan or China for probably a third of what it would cost for me to make it based on just natural ability, you know? So hopefully so that answers the question. You went, yeah. <laughs> You went from um, rejecting the idea of marine biology because it wasn't really going to uh, provide you with a paycheck and jumped into um, amateur pipe making where you spend hundreds and hundreds of hours on making pipes that are never going. So, <laughs> so the, the, the math still doesn't work. So what kept you going? I, I've, got, I've grown accustomed to living very inexpensively in a very expensive area. So um, most people, they take, you know, a two week vacation every year. I don't, uh, and that's not really a financial decision. I just really, I'm not a big traveler anymore. My, my childhood was spent backpacking through the Sierras and canoeing in Minnesota. And, and I was outdoors and doing all kinds of stuff all the time. And I, I guess I kind of just, settle down a little bit you know i, I want to kind of be in my in my cave and, and just create things um and uh it's i think the i forgot the second half of your question i'm sorry i kind of went off on a tangent there that's all right and so what i was digging at is um without putting words in your mouth the, the discovery of of a passion Mm -hmm. Right. So it wasn't like um, pipe making was immediately going to solve your financial problems. So oh, fina financial. Gotcha. Me, right. Yeah. So the, the that part, um, I kind of I guess to 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 continue with what I was saying, I kind of pulled everything in and just became a pipe maker. That's what I did. You know, that, that was my fun and that was my work. Um, Throughout the years, I've had various jobs. Um, I, I worked for a social media company for a while as a, as a director of sales for that and uh, made a pretty good living doing that. That ended up supporting, you know, the beginning middle of my, my business. And there's also some, there's an, uh, you know, an elephant in the room here that we have to sort of discuss is the pipe boom. Um, now this is something that people, you know, it's whispered and legend and, and 
you know, oh, I remember back in the day, there were guys selling pipes for this and this amount, whatever. But uh, there was a time in, in my early days where uh, it, just by pure happenstance and luck, um, all of my pipes were being listed at auction, starting at a penny, and they would sell. I mean, it, it went on for a few years where they were selling for $1,000, $2,000, $3,000 a piece for, for amateur pipes. I mean, the, these are in every time one sold, I would be a little more freaked out because it wasn't <laughs> an excitement about the money. It was like, that pipe is worth $300. Why are you spending $2,700 on it? Um, but there were bidding wars. The Chinese market was emerging. The Russian market was sort of at its peak slash decline. And there's, there's a, there are micro economies based around pipes. Uh, even in the States, we, we had some very high dollar collectors for a long time. And over time, they just lost interest. And there are only a handful now that really spend some serious bucks on pipes. And when I say serious, I mean, there are people out there that regularly spend two, three, four thousand dollars on an American made pipe. Um, and that that changes completely when you go over to like the Danish uh, legends. You know, there are uh, Bo Nord pipes that go for many tens of thousands of dollars in China on a regular basis. Um, Teddy Knudsen, uh, people that are still alive, Tom. Eltang pipes that are sold like his his special golden contrast, the M M grades, all the, the, the crazy high end shit that you never really see. Um, there are pipes that that I've made for for extremely wealthy clientele that I wasn't even allowed to show ever. Like there's pipes that that I've made that no one has seen because that was the agreement. Wow. So one that you that you can see that was a a pretty intensive piece of work was uh uh on the cover of pipes magazine um i actually have it hanging up here it was the uh the warden's calabashian smoke box and um let's see because i got my hydraulic press in the way here reverse so this pipe here took about six or seven months to complete every piece except for except for where's my finger except for that top piece there every piece was completely scratch made um it's hollow you, so it's, you a, made it's that? basically it yeah so it's a it's a table pipe uh but it is big i mean it's probably an eight inch eight inch cube and uh inside those are those are acrylic windows so i had to basically bore a hole through the top and then basically trim the acrylic. <laughs> it's, so, it's so hard to explain. There's photos somewhere on my site. Um, and then those are actual bronze, like bulkhead pieces that were milled out to go on the outside. And then the inside is completely hollow and it's smooth and round on the outside, it's flat. So I had to do some creative machining to get that thing done. But it was for a friend of mine, um, it was for a friend of mine who is a, uh, he's, he's basically, diver. he's, well, he's mainly, a, he's actually a quadriplegic. He has a muscular degenerative disorder where he can't hold a pipe traditionally. So it's got the, you know, it's a table pipe. So he can just sit there in his chair and puff away and he still smokes it uh, once in a while. I'm not sure. He's trying to preserve his health, obviously, especially with the wildfires. But um, oh. and and the COVID thing, he can't he can't go outside or see anyone because he'd be, you know, gone. But um, yeah, so I mean that that's part of it. Is is there were high dollar pipes sold in the past? Uh, then I got to mature point in my work where my work was too expensive for the market. And uh, I had people asking, hey, I really want, uh, well, I'm sorry, I rewind a little bit. I it came up with a, a product in 2009 called the Briar Cigar. And that was sort of my first foray into a factory made product because, you know, I, I made the first maybe 300 in house, one at a time, uh, tried to make them exactly the same size. And it, it's, 
it's an unbelievable amount of work when when you're trying to do that kind of volume with one person on traditional machinery and make it all the same size uh and it that ended up working great i mean i did that and then the demand got too high so i sourced uh sourced it out to a uh, a friend of a friend who owned a factory in italy and now they produce all the briar cigars and that that helps fund at the time that was helping fund you know me being able to make you know very labor intensive pipes and not, and not sell them for you know 10 grand got it let me let me pause you right there for a second chris um, yeah because it seems like a good point to sort of segue into phase one of your your career to phase to so sure. to speak. And I thought I would pause and sort of open it up to the group and see if you guys, uh, you know, I know that there's some questions that have, that have been popping up already, but um, now's a good time to maybe throw out some questions to Chris and that way I don't do all the I'd, talking. I'd love, I'd love to ask him some questions. I, I probably got a million, like we're not, we're not going to have enough in an hour, but I'll try to be polite and ask like two or something. Okay. Um, By the way, before you start talking, Bart, that sky is ridiculous. That is so yeah. Gorgeous. Thanks. So gorgeous. It is. <laughs> thanks. Yeah, I live I live near a near a forest, so there's very little light pollution here, and that's that's why the sky is so amazingly nice. It's it's a beautiful area to live in. I'll post some pictures of it tomorrow. You can see like the 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 forest we live in. It's really nice. Wow. Um, First of all, Chris, thank you for being here. I really appreciate you accepting my invitation, and sure, I'm, thank you. I'm glad I'm glad you you were able to join us. Um, there's actually two questions I have because uh, at one point you're talking about uh, making pipes as a living and how that became an option purely based on demand, let's say, or on the way the economy of pipes work at that moment in time. Mm -hmm. But obviously, you stepped away quite far from that now because I think. Uh, at least, uh, I mean, people in this group know that I'm a, I'm a large fan of your pipes. And that's basically because it does two things right. It smokes really well and it's very cheap. Thank and you. that's not really something um, monetary-wise very interesting because you sell a great smoking pipe at a really cheap price. So, mm -hmm. so where did that change kind of come into play where you kind of decided to go from the really high-end stuff? Because I never knew you made this kind of really intricate intricate pipes that, that were selling for such a high dollar. So so where did that switch come about? And then now I hear you and I know a little bit that you, you take your blacksmithing quite seriously. We talked about your anvil and I know that's that's a proper machine and you bought that with intent. That's not something you just find. So you're mm -hmm. obviously putting some focus there too. So how can it be that you made uh, the switch to making such cheap pipes and and how can it be that now you're focusing on something else and how do you see that evolving in the future that's that's maybe the two-part question i have so i'll kind of tell you the evolution of how bones came about um but the blacksmithing has been kind of a hobby where same let's see how do i form this into a sentence um where pipe making became a growing over the years sort of thing where I slowly accumulated tooling, uh, replaced you know cheaper tooling that I had previously previously bought, upgraded tooling uh, as I learned. Um, with blacksmithing, I wanted to start with a fully professional shop, and in all honesty, I needed some write-offs last year and the year before. And you know, my my CPA said, "Hey, you know, is there anything else you want to do or buy?" I was like, what do, you, what do you mean? What should I buy? He's like, like a CNC machine. I was like, well, I'm not going to go that crazy, but I'll get some, you know, I've always wanted to do blacksmithing. Um, and I have in the past, you know, I, I did maybe 10 years ago, make a few knives on a, a charcoal forge with a, a hair dryer, you know, and a, and a piece of steel and, and it worked out pretty well. And I remembered yeah, that and I figure, you know, let's, let's do that. So I researched that and, and ended up buying a lot of uh, pretty expensive equipment, to be honest. I never really realized that uh, an anvil, you know, being a chunk of steel, uh, was going to be a that hard to find in California, and b that expensive if I had one custom, uh, custom made. So, fully appreciate that, your pain. 
it, it was intense. I mean, it was just sticker shock after sticker shock, but I'm happy I did it because they're tools that you never have to replace. Um, for the pipes, I, when I was producing, uh, you know, at my peak of production, both commission wise and on my site, you would generally find my pipes anywhere from 400 for a simple sandblast up to 1200 for a really nice signature shape and smooth. And that was the average. There were pipes that went far beyond that. And there were pipes, some pipes that I did for friends and was, you know, uh, for other means that, that were a little cheaper than that. But uh, still a lot of people were saying, hey, your pipes are too expensive. I, or I can't afford them. And so I, I knew I had the Briar Cigar already um, at the time it was being patented and it was being produced and all that. And it was, it was doing great. So I figured why not do a line of pipes, you know, we'll call it, I don't know, blackjack, you know, we were just kind of playing around with ideas. Um, and so I put out the first three blackjack pipes. Well, pr prior to that, yeah, I guess, yeah, I did the blackjack line. But prior to that, I did the raw line, which were pipes that were not, uh, not finished, they, like no staining, sandblast, pre-made stem, finished by me, and they were like 250. And people still felt that that was a little too high for the average person. So when Blackjack came along, uh, that went very well. Um, but it's still, for, for the vast majority of smokers, you know, you, you're talking many more uh, corn cob pipe smokers in this country than, than Briar exclusively. And most people's budgets are significantly lower than you would think. You know, I, I have customers sometimes that say I've been saving up for months for a bones pipe. And uh, I wanted to access that market that was sort of forgotten. You know, a lot of people just said, well, that's, that's corn cob territory. Uh, you know, generally those people buy really um, like basket pipes. And that's just, it's been an understood thing. Yeah, you want to start smoking a pipe, get a basket pipe. But my problem with basket pipes is that a lot of them are filled with that nasty pink putty. Um, they have, you know, really heavy coatings, finishes, stuff like that. The stems aren't great. And I wanted to kind of give something at a higher perceived value. Um, so I talked to my guys and, and they had uh, boxes and boxes and boxes of waste just tons of pipes that you can't finish. You know, someone orders, uh, you know, 500 of this particular shape, they need it smooth. You might have 30%, 40% of that waste. And they've already gotten paid for it because they factored into the cost, but that waste sits there and then they shoveled into a wood stove to further dry a uh, new briar that just came in for, for working uh, or they use it to heat the factory. And I said, well, why are we wasting these? Let's use them as pipes. You guys get paid again for product you already got paid for. I get pipes at a fairly inexpensive price and I'm able to offer to my customers for, for a crazy low price. At the time when I, when I came out with these 39 bucks, people were just walking around with their heads blowing up. You know, they, they couldn't believe how inexpensive uh, a pipe was being offered from a parent company. Most, most factory pipes, um, most factory brands will not claim seconds. And that, that was another piece of the puzzle. Like I'm gonna claim these, these are, these are gonna be covered under warranty. I'm not hiding anything. There's no fills. There might be a black bowl coating because some people do prefer that. Uh, but usually it's about 50, 50 coated versus uncoated. You can always request coated or uncoated at checkout on my site. Uh, but that's pretty much where that came from. I, 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 I feel, every bit as much as much passion about the bones line as I did about doing my high grade stuff. Uh, the only difference is the amount of people that I serve now is significantly higher. Um, the brand kind of has its own legs. It, it's taken on its own, its own thing to where I don't really even need to be that involved in it. And I would prefer it that way. Let the pipe speak for themselves. It's a tool, you know, enjoy it and uh, be, be proud to own a collection of them for what they are. We did have a, a speaking of the, the bones, um, let me see if I can find the question here. 
Um, because to be honest with you, I am new to Bones. This is my second one. I actually am, am, am breaking it in today, just in honor of having you here. <laughs> um, Thank you. And uh, so, I, so I don't know all the different lines that you've had, but you said uh, somebody wants to know if, if you have another batch of Arbutus Bones in the near future. And also, when's the next batch of jerky? Next batch, batch of jerky, that's a good question. So because of, um, because of the COVID thing, I kind of held off a little bit. Actually, this here is the last bag. Um, but I'm mainly saving it as a, for a flavor comparison to the new batch. But um, It's my Arbutus. The, the, yeah, the Arbutus line, the Arbutus bones are kind of a tricky thing because uh, Arbutus generally is not a flawed wood. So when it comes in, it's pretty clean. And the flaws that it does have are gigantic. So if it's going to have any flaws, there'll be these insane cracks. And those immediately are unusable because the cracks are usually not from the growth process. They're more from the drying process. Uh, grain will pull up away from itself. It's not as uh, cohesive as Briar is. It's a, it's a much lighter and, and uh, less dense product, which is why people like it. It's lighter weight and uh, sometimes people feel that it smokes a little drier but um, generally most Arbutus pipes are Arbutus pipes they become the premium line for that price point uh, a Arbutus is insanely expensive compared to Briar uh, mainly because of certain politics in Italy uh, I don't know how deep into that I can get but uh Briar cutters are, they want to dig briar. And if they do find Arbutus, it's, it's a rarity. Now, when I put in an order for Arbutus, they send that back to the mill and the mill sends that to uh, the harvesters. And it's, there's a lot of tricky stuff that you have to get through for a specific Arbutus harvest. So that's why you don't see Arbutus pipes that much in any brand. I mean, I think there might've been only one, one or two others that I've ever seen. Um, but when I do bones Arbutus, it drops the price significantly and then it ends up being less money for everyone down the line. And that's kind of hard. Uh, it's hard to pull off. We do have a question um, from the YouTube group over here. Can um, you can get bones in the UK, can't you? Yes, at Smoke King, uh, smoke-king.co.uk, I believe. Um, and, one time, just yeah, I'm that's right. I bought one there. He's right. You can get them in the okay. UK. So yeah, smoke-king.co.uk. I believe. I'm. I might be. I'm not real good with uh, international URLs. I always get those screwed up, but. Claire and her team over there are rock stars. Um, they have actually, they just built a brand new shop. They're doing extremely well. Um, and they have all kinds of cool stuff in that shop. Awesome. So yeah. anybody else in the in, guys, um, we have, uh, we have the, the man himself here. So what, uh, what other questions we're, we're going to make lots of time to ask questions along the way here. And I'm going to get back into his, his, uh, his journey of, of pipe, and pipe business development, because I think we're about to find out some pretty interesting things about his business sense here. Um, I can tell right away, even if he hadn't told me that he worked uh, in uh, social media sales, um, <laughs> I can tell by the way he talks about the business part that he that he's pretty familiar with that. So, um, but up to this point, what else? What else, you guys, want to ask him? No questions, Chris. I just want to tell you, I love all my bones. No, I appreciate that. Thank you. Lowell's quite a collector. Lowell, how many do you have? Yeah, he's got a lot. I think I got 15. <laughs> That's I'm a good like, amount. I traded off a couple of them. But I still got about 12 or 13, I think, something like that. You know, and I'll, I want to interject something, too, with Bones, that, that has surprised me since it's kind of gained its own life. I mean, it, it is its own thing. I could completely walk out of the picture and it would still be its own thing, which I, I enjoy so much. I can't tell you that's a, 
a rare thing to have a business do that. Um, it's a very crowd, crowd uh, run brand. So if you say, hey, I really want to see some of these shapes, eventually I'll be able to get to it and launch some of those shapes. But my point being, when I'll give you insight as a maker, when I would see one of my handmade pieces uh, be resold, and it's happened over the years, many, many, many times, people would buy like a, a $900 pipe and then you'd see it on eBay for like 600. Mm -hmm. And it, it is the most crushing feeling you can imagine because you put all that work into it and someone is selling it at a discount. And you know, that's, that's the hard part because you want your prices to stay high, but if they're too high, then you're too expensive and you're not selling. So it's a balance, but people will sell and resell and resell these bones. They've been, they'll be smoked into the ground and you'll see them pop up like, Hey, I'll trade you three of these for a brand new, whatever. And I love that so much because it, it really embodies the spirit of what it is. It is a tool, you know, it's, it's a pipe. I, I've said over and over again, bones are pipes. They're nothing more, nothing less. Don't expect, you know, for unicorns to come floating out of the smoke and, and don't expect for them to go up in flames there. It's a pipe. So go ahead. Sorry. I, I had to interject that, but it just, That's it's awesome. A, you, you have created a, a following around a particular line of your own creation. That's gotta feel wonderful. It is, and I, I owe a lot of that to the early adopters. You know, Gene, uh, who came in as a collector later, Gene Boker, who runs, he's sort of the the, the godfather of, of the Bones, the official now Bones, uh, Morgan Bones fan club. So it's not me that people are fans of, it's the Bones. And for the <laughs> longest time, I was disavowing any sort of officiality to that group. Like I, I was like, Gene, we, I'm not making it official. Like I'm, I'm not the most humble person, but I'm also not that arrogant to where I'm like, yes, I have a fan club. Um, <laughs> it just, it, it felt so yeah. awkward to me. Well, I want to validate well, what, you, what you said, Chris, because uh, that's how uh, I wound up with my first uh, bones was through this club because you're not on smokingpipes.com where I get the vast majority of my pipes and it was a word of mouth thing. And as soon as I got this thing out of the box is when, when you hold it in your hand, you look at it. Uh, then you realize the genius of the price point. You know, like I said, it's, yeah. it's totally unpretentious. I have pipes that, you know, I, I don't want anything to happen to them. And this is just like my, you know, F-150 pickup. It's great. Yep. <laughs> as it should be. I mean, even, even for me, um, I, <laughs> I, I have some extremely nice pipes. I, I collect uh, I collect Elteng pipes when I can. And just because he's, he's a friend of mine, and he's a, a great, um, I look up to him, basically. I always have. Uh, and I, so I, I buy some of his pipes whenever I can. But I got to be honest, on, on most days, I'll just pull out a Bones pipe because if I drop it, if I leave it full and not completely smoked, if I don't clean it, you know, I'm, I'm much, uh, much more satisfied ruining a bones pipe than I am, you know, an, an L tank or something nice. And I, I, I heard uh, DDR mentioned, are you in San Jose? So I'm on the outskirts of San Jose. I'm in Los Gatos. Okay, so at the man. foot of the uh, Santa Cruz mountains. I teach at Saratoga high school. I'm in Santa Clara. My wife's mom works there. <laughs> it's Saratoga. So, yeah. Yeah. unbelievable yeah weird i'm i'm trying to figure out who i'm talking to through this oh todd because... dwyer all right where are you todd i saw you earlier uh i wanted to be mobile on my phone here and uh just keep you? talking todd your picture will okay. pop up with like your green border well, I, I was, yeah. I was oh there you are about... there you are there i am yeah okay yeah okay i got i i gotta ask what who is she what, what What's her name? Uh, we'll uh, we'll leave that okay. Off. Yeah, uh, we'll yeah, do yeah. that another time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> leave that off the air. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, cool. Just because we've had a couple of of experiences where, let's say, uninvited guests appeared, and yeah. so we're, we'll take care of that offline. No, it's cool. You know, I'm gonna get a I'm gonna get called into the superintendent's office anyway. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Con content. What are you doing on that pipe club? 
talking <laughs> about. Contact me on the messenger and I'll, I'll kind of give you the, uh, the rundown, but yeah, yeah, yeah. the, the, um, uh, shit. What was I going to say? I swear uh, to God, I, I've seen you at Bass Pro Outlets. I know I have. Ma maybe. I, possibly. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, so the, what was I saying? Oh, so based on what was just said about we've had uninvited visitors, that is really the biggest pitfall um, of the situation when I was doing high grade stuff. And when I started just coming out with the factory stuff, because I would have people that would be in town on business. Um, and I would have like, uh, we'll call them fans of, of my pipes in China and Taiwan and Russia. And they would show up in town looking for my shop, you know, as if like, you know, like Tom Eltang's shop is a private shop, but it's on a main thoroughfare in Copenhagen. You can technically go and check it out. My shop is at my house. And uh, I would have people that would go to the local cigar shop thinking it was my shop looking for me. And they would call me because I had a membership there at the time. And they'd be, say, they'd be saying like, oh, there's a, there's a guy down here and he's looking for you. I'm like, don't tell him where I live. Like, I, <laughs> this isn't a public option. Like, I'm not having random people at my house. So, What's your, uh, hey, what's your uh, favorite smoke? That's a hard question. Uh, I don't have to worry about it getting sold out anymore so I can talk about it. But um, I like McCraney's. Anything from McCraney's is, is basically, uh, I like that. I like uh, Tawny Flake from Blakeney's Best, which is McClellan's. This is good stuff. Um, I'm trying to think what else. I like McBaron Rustica. That one recently came out. Uh, I think it was this year, and that one's really good. Uh, but one of my all-time favorites is Jermaine's Brown Flake and uh, Lane Amduyo, which got just got discontinued. Yes, uh, we have. I have another question. Mm -hmm. Sorry, David. No, no, go ahead. I was going to ask, um, when we're talking about favorite tobacco, I'm also very curious about uh, favorite shape because you offer so many. And I mean, I know my favorite and that's the, the hand, hanging brandy you, you sent to me. And then I got a pot and I really like that as well. And I'm thinking about getting a poker like uh, our other friend uh, in the club here because he nicely set it down on the table. But uh, what's, what's your favorite shape? Because you do quite a, a big range if you factor in the ones and uh, well, maybe the blackjacks are, are not particularly different shapes, but like, what's, yeah. what's your favorite pipe in your lineup or your favorites, maybe? Um, I like anything, like any short apple sort of shape. I like really petite pipes. I'm not big on, uh, generally, because I, I just, I don't have an hour to smoke usually. <laughs> um, and actually why I'm not having a pipe right now I, I may still but it the air quality is really bad here and i just don't want to aggravate that but uh um yeah i would say small straight pipes are kind of my thing generally is that where the where the one series came from like you you took the stubbies just to a different level or hold, hold, the one? That, hold that thought because i want to i want to sort of draw out the whole story of the one uh, okay yeah yeah so so bart that's a Perfect question, but let's let me get him to expand on that for a second. Um, any other uh, question? I'm gonna I'm gonna jump back in and ask ask um, uh, Chris to continue with the building of his of his empire. And uh, um, before I do that, let's see what other questions you guys. I just might. had a I just had a question. What's your uh, most popular shape that you sell? The twenty. So this this one with the shorter stem is easily the hottest selling shape. Uh, let's say this one and anything weird that I come out with, like I just came out with these like weird calabash shapes and those sold very quickly, but the 20 is consistently what people want. That's hey. 
so what do you think is the reason for that? When you when you have a hot selling pipe, what what do you think? Uh, is it just it a phenomenon or what? It changes. I, I had a shape. A while, I think it was last year called the uh, tulip, and it was it was actually. Uh, I was a little disappointed when they sent it to me because I was sort of surprised. Um, it was basically a half raised pipe that they ended up finishing. So the bowl was cut on the inside and outside. It was all drilled and everything, but it wasn't fully machine phrased. So it was probably going to be like a, po a poker or, or something, or maybe it was like, you know, it was probably a weird shape anyway, but it just wasn't finished on the machine and they either were like, that looks cool. Let's send that to them, finish it up and send it. And I was livid when I got them and they sold faster than anything I've ever had in stock. Like I was, and I had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these things. Um, and they just out the door. And I, I thought it was the ugliest shape ever, but it sold very quickly. Awesome. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit back to the story about um, so you you've now um, established yourself as a as a pipe carver. You you've gotten some following who are um, purchasing your high end pipes, and and now you're inspired to create a new line called the Bones, and it's it's grown immediately successful. Um, was there a phase that I'm missing, sort of in between those two, or is that sort of how it it went in? I, that's it, it kind of mainly happened after after blackjack it was maybe three years after blackjacks uh came out i was still getting comments that the blackjacks were a little outside people's price range which makes sense um you know if if you're just a regular guy or gal uh and pipes are not you know your core interest maybe you're a ham radio operator and that's that's your hobby or you like to uh fish you know something like that where you know you're already spending your money on another hobby and you're like i kind of want to smoke a pipe but i don't want to spend a hundred dollars on each pipe because you know i need three of them or i need 10 of them or, or whatever your rotation is uh 39 bucks becomes a very attractive price point for people and uh i think that's that's led to a lot of the success with it, but it was also a, a weird conversation with a friend of mine uh, who helped me sort of form the idea of doing a bones line or an unfinished, you know, basically a byproduct line. Like these are pipes that normally would be sold off to the highest bidder and finished with all kinds of stuff. And, you know, Hey, they look kind of pretty, but there's pink spots and, you know, Nothing against people that like uh, basket pipes, but that's always been a big thing for me. Like I'll always spend a little bit more when I was starting to smoke, spend a little bit more to not have a basket pipe because I didn't like the putty fills and all this stuff. Um, and all that kind of came down to one conversation and, and I was joking around with him and he said, uh, what are you going to sell these for? He's like, I was like, I don't know. What do you think? He's like, I don't know. I think like 49. I was like, all right, well, it's 39 then. Because, you know, you, you want to hit a point where people are like, holy shit, that's really inexpensive. And they get the pipe and they're like, wow, that's a really high quality pipe. I'm surprised that he can offer it for so cheap. There's no magic there. It's volume. It's, it's uh, you know, a lot of pipes come out of the shop on a daily basis. And that's really the only way you can do this is massive, massive. Um, can you guys it's genius. Me? Um, May I, I have come? a question. Hello? I have a question. Chris, I'm on your website. I'm looking at the hanging brandy. But how do you buy this? Because when I go down, when I scroll down, it doesn't show it. It's actually this one, oh, there uh, just to show you. That's the one I'm smoking now. That's a hanging brandy. Just yeah. just to give you an idea of what it looks like in real okay. life. Okay. And then what about, it goes, I go down, it says <clears throat> choose your shape. It didn't have the poker one, short poker. Does that mean it's not available? Am I back Hello? now? Yeah. Oh, I got, I got cut oh, out. I got dropped. I got oh. dropped out of the call. 
Sorry, oh. I missed all that. Oh, I, I had a question. I'm on your website and I was looking at the bones pipes and I like the, uh, the, that one poker, not uh -huh. the cherry wood, the other one, but I scroll down and it's not on that list where it says, choose your shape. How would you it's buy sold. that? So it would be sold out. So the shapes oh, okay. rotate. Yeah. If, if it's not in the drop down menu, okay. then I, it's not in stock. Okay. Got uh, it. There's, so there's uh, I forgot where I was, what I was saying before, but there's 300 ish, 350, somewhere in there. It's hard to tell at this point because some shapes are so similar, but there are many hundreds of bones shapes out there. And I'm actually in the process of compiling a catalog so that you uh, as a customer can go through the catalog and say, Hey, I need to get like another 20, 30 guys on board and yell at them about this one shape that I want made. And that's where I come up with the crowd sourced atmosphere. Mm -hmm. That way people can say like, I really like this shape. Hey, you guys like this shape? Let's do it. What and if you had a pipe club that wanted a particular shape and we got like 20, 30 guys to commit to buying a shape? Yeah. David, I will commit right now. All right. I did it. I, I did it. I did it with Cup of Joe's. Right on. All right, gentlemen, uh, this is a topic of conversation for next week there. Yeah. How about a Canadian? Totally doable. Chris, there's one shape that I, I, I saw someone uh, sell it. They, I guess they didn't want it, uh, but I was in love with it. I messaged the guy and he said, oh, I just stole it, sold it to someone. I was so angry. It was the Goldfish Reverse Calabash. I think it was cold. I don't those know if are, you call that those shape. are rare. Those are really rare. rare. <laughs> oh yeah. my God. I I want one so bad. <laughs> I I'm gonna try it. to bring those back. They're they're really tricky because that is not traditional. Uh so there, there's a couple of things that you have to kind of and I I have to remind some people sometimes because they like, I want to Ramsey's, and I'm like, not possible. These these are yeah, you have to see how these things are made on a machine. Um and sometimes there's weird stuff like the blowfish that blew my mind. I was like, how do they even do this? Uh, but there's, you have to look at like traditional Italian shapes and that's what's possible because their machines are made in such a way to where, you know, the, the, all these things are hand finished. They're all, you know, there's guys on wheels and belts and finishing and, and all that, but the angles, the drilling, all that stuff has to fit a certain rhetoric. If that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. So, so you make so many uh, uh, unfinished pipes. I've seen online a lot of people finish them themselves. Mm -hmm. um, what uh, have you seen? Some really cool uh, finishing colors, or what has been your favorite custom job people have done to your pipes? I there's a lot. Uh, I personally say don't don't finish them. Leave them alone. Let them color over time. But people get impatient or they want something really unique. Um, I have a customer that runs a Cerakoting facility. So he Cerakotes firearms and knives and that kind of stuff. And he Cerakoted a, a couple of bones and he does it from time to time and sells them. And it's, they're very strange. Uh, like just to look at a color and there's like no shine to it is really weird. Like it almost has this void of light um, I have been playing around and I'm, I have not, I'm not going to show anything about it yet, but I've been playing around with Vanta black to basically create a pipe that disappears on a black surface. And it is much harder <laughs> to finish than you think. <laughs> it's a very weird Van material. Vanta black is very interesting. It yeah. doesn't absorb mm -hmm. any light at all. And well, I no, only it, know that. It absorbs oh, all the light. Oh, yeah. That's, that's that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. And I, the only reason I know of that is because of BMW painting one single vehicle with it and they can't retail it because it's a hazard at night. <laughs> yeah. So actually that's a very interesting material. I, I had a conversation with a guy the other day about it because he uh, he there's a guy in town that has a BMW and it has this it's like a what do you call it? Ice black ice. Mm -hmm. And it it's a damn close color to that Vanta black, but it's more yeah. visible. Frozen and black. Was, yes. fro frozen black. That's what it is. And I was like, yeah. that is a that's a nice nice color. Um, 
but yeah, it is, Van well, I don't use, I haven't been using the actual Vanta Black because it is protected by the developer. And that's a whole, yeah. that's a whole other uproar in the art community, but yeah, um, it's a new product that's very similar that is carbon nanotubes and it, it does basically the same thing. It pigment is ridiculous. It's basically. weird. It's a it's weird a, it's material. A, it's a magic of chemistry that's beyond my comprehension. <laughs> Same here. Same here. <laughs> sounds, sounds like it would have a uh, military applications as a cloaking device. It the only thing that's pro the problem with it is that it's not very stable. It's kind of a mm -hmm. it's a dusty product because of what is in it. Um, so you would almost have to top coat it with something, and then that would take away all of its properties. So it's it's mainly like a it's a novelty as far as I can tell. It's sort of that uh, what's it called ice gel or whatever that that the lightest material in the world. And it, it looks like it's not really there, but there's like a cube in this guy's hand and it weighs nothing. And I don't know if you guys have probably seen that. I forget the name air of gel. it, but what is it? The, the air gel, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. bluish. Yeah, it's kind of bluish and it's it's cool for like chemistry teachers and stuff because they're like, hey, check this out. But it's like, if you, you can squish it, I mean, it's really delicate. We had a couple of questions that come on over from the uh, YouTube group over there. Yeah. Uh, I, I promised them I would try to get their questions in. The first one is, and this is a good one. We, we might jump into this a little bit later, but we might as well do it now. It says, where do you see yourself in 20 years? I have no idea. <laughs> no, in context, you know, like, yeah, where, okay. Where's in, your, in, okay. Um, without giving too much away, I, I have broken into other, businesses over the past couple of years. Uh, I can't say a ton about it yet because it's not public, but I have been doing um, film consulting. I've been doing prop making. Um, I just spent all last year on a very, very, very large production um, that when it comes out, I'll, I'll announce it and everyone's going to be able to see it. It's something I'm really proud of. Um, I, the jerky may expand i am working on sauces and, and seasonings and stuff like that here and there uh pipes the bones i see expansion and i'm, I'm planning on expanding it to to a level that would fit my my younger goal of seeing bones in every single shop across the u.s that's awesome that's a that's a big shoot for the moon thing um but i want to replace I, I want to replace the the basket pipe, not with unfinished bones necessarily, but create a, a personal oversight into that faction of the business. I, yes. I think that the quality can be raised uh, across the board. If that makes that's sense. Um, I think, first of all, from just personally, that's an amazing goal. I'd love to see that happen too. That's, that's awesome. Um, the other question that came up from YouTube was, um, what happened to the pipes with the lightning bolts on the finish? Are those still available? Yeah, yeah I still do them. Uh, they carry a three to four week lead time uh, because I have to run them in batches. They're, it's a dangerous process. I will be wrapping it up here shortly. I think we'll do maybe one more run after this one. And then we're done for the winter because uh, when it's humid or wet outside, there's a a magical uh, bit of science that happens, and you create you essentially create your own magnetic field while you're doing it around you, uh, and you are creating a ton of ozone, and it is electricity, and it's a it's a very freaky feeling. But if if I'm doing this and it's wet outside, say it's like eighty percent humidity or something, uh, I feel as if I drank like four or five beers when I'm done, like it, it does kind of fog you a little bit. So I try to do it when it's, you know, when it's dry out. Awesome. Awesome. But that's still, that's available. That's available on every, if you what? buy a one pipe, if you buy a bones, if you buy a one bone series, um, from time to time I offer them on Briar cigars, but those are a separate pre-finished product on Briar cigars. So we, what part of the process is it that, that messes with you so bad? So the electricity, I'm, I'm running about 12,000 
volts at 35 amps and it's open air. So if the, if the humidity is too high inside the shop, there's a certain amount of static that's coming off of that and it forms like a static field. Um, it's, not, it's not anything you notice until you start feeling it and you feel drowsy and you just kind of, it's not like a, it's not a massive danger in that respect. It is a lot of electricity. I want to try so is that. it this? Is it the stem making? No, the lightning finish is uh, so. You, basically, I oh, I, it's I, the finish. Okay, it's the finish. So I so I basically soak a pipe in an electrolyte solution, which is baking soda, which is the most call it the most food grade that that you can for this process. Hold on one second, guys. If you go to your gallery view, Josh is holding up a sample of what he's talking about. Oh, okay. Yeah. I don't so I th this one has um I put some oil on it so it's a little dark, but this is one of the lightning finishes. The ants. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, yeah that's good. Hold it back a little further and keep talking so everybody sees. Okay. So this is the ants. It's got um yeah, it's kinda hard it's to a little see. Hard here, to but see. Maybe on the bottom you can see a little bit better. There you go. Yeah. It, no. it, I don't have it got here, it got too it got too dark, but um, actually this is a Lowell pipe. This is this is a secondary a secondary Bones Market pipe right here. Love it. Thanks, Josh. So basically, I don't know. Whoops. Where's mine? What I do? Okay, I'm back. That's, That's looking weird. really nice. That's one of my first bones I got. So it's a few years old. You've smoked that quite a bit, haven't you? I mean, it's yep. followed up really nicely. Hey, Chris, can you okay. leave you again? It looks like you. I, I got lost. See, because I'm on a phone. I wanted to be able to be mobile and show you guys stuff, or else I would have done it on my computer. Yeah, no, this is good. Um, um, let me ask you real quick about uh, the Briar Cigar, and then we'd love to see your shop if you, if you don't mind yeah. talking us about. Yeah, sure. So I've never smoked a Briar Cigar. I've seen them, and I'm like, that's interesting. Um, how do you smoke that? Um, so basically, you want to use a, a finer cut or drier tobacco uh, with them. I find that that's probably the best way to do it something that's not goopy uh definitely not any heavy aromatics or anything it works a lot of guys still get by with that but personally that's just how i am um and you pack it uh a little lighter than you would a normal pipe and light it and then just tamp tamp like normal uh rotate the cigar and it's it it's a very um once you start smoking it it's very obvious but it takes a little while to get the hang of it you know, it's, it's not a huge effort, but there is definitely a learning curve for some people. And it's the other thing I like to say too, is you don't need one. You know, you really don't. There's uh, some in Europe, they're, they're referred to as a, a novelty and it's not like a derogatory term, but they just call certain stuff like that novelty. And I always took that really poorly. I'm like, it's not a novelty, man. I spent so much money creating this, and <laughs> getting it patented and, you know, I thought they were just shitting on my idea. And I'm like, they're like, no, no, they, we just call it a novelty because it's not like a, it's not a necessity, you know, it's, it's cute basically. Um, but in, in that process of creating it, a lot of things had to be changed. Uh, originally it didn't have an RC chamber. And then I ended up putting an RC chamber in it and it changed everything and made it smoke much better. Uh, and then I decided that, well, since that's my idea, I'm going to patent it. And now I basically own the rights to the Briar cigar or a cigar shaped pipe with an RC chamber. Awesome. Do you want to maybe uh, walk us around your shop? As well? Yeah. Do that. Yeah. So the room I'm in now, I'm not going to show very much of, but uh, this is a lot of the inventory is going to be in these racks. Uh, right now, inventory is fairly low, but that'll be picking up uh, pretty soon here. Uh, big old dust collector. 
Um, got a rotary air compressor here, but I have some schematics over there, so I won't show that. Uh, got heat treat oven for the knives that need it. Um, is that a Paragon you, oven, uh, Chris? This is an even heat. So it's the even heat LB. Right. Um, and this will do anything up to 20, 2200 degrees. So pretty much any, any stainless steel, any high alloy metals, stuff like that. That is uh, a nice looking. Uh, thank you. Yeah, it's, I tend to go a little overboard. I didn't really need it, but then I ended up doing some D2 knives, which require you to hold 1900 degrees and then plate quench, which is a whole other weird yeah. process. That when I saw most... you were doing the D2, I was like, that's pretty ambitious. It's intense. And what's, what's cool furthermore is they, the D2, uh, the D2 blades came out at exactly uh, 59 Rockwell throughout which wow, i was very that, that's insane that's crazy well, that's see, that's not, i mean that's not only me that's the that's the oven <laughs> but here's one of the i love the that's d2s a, they are brilliant it, it, they look so great thank you and it, it's like i still need to work on finishing but uh you know i've come a long way since since this guy this was one of the first knives that I did, which was uh, my Damascus. I don't know if anyone can see that. I mean, that still looks good. I mean, that's, that's at least like uh, between 60 and 100 layers. That still looks really, really nice. Teardrop pattern, it's not bad. This is actually, this is like uh, about 300, I think. I lost a lot of it though, towards the, uh, how did edge. you etch it? Like in uh, sulfuric acid, or did you use anything else? This one is uh, sulfuric. Uh, this one is. Um, what did I use for this? Hold on. Ferric chloride. I just want to apologize for hijacking the pipe meeting and talking about blacksmithing, but you know, <laughs> a common interest, we'll say. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. blacksmith club is on Thursdays, uh, Martin. So. Yeah. I'm sorry, so I'll shut up now. <laughs> I'll get back to it. Um, I don't mind if you guys have any questions about any of this stuff. So uh, pretty much this is sort of the area of the shop where I've got a lot of the blacksmithing stuff. Um, I'm not, my books are not currently open for handmade pipes. So I'm mainly doing any metal work, copper work, uh, knives, decorative stuff, little tools, trinkets, stuff like that. So here's my mill. Uh, this is a uh, grinder here for knife making. This has all kinds of different attachments and dust collection and, and all that kind of fun stuff. I have a water dump down here. So all the sparks when I'm grinding blades or any metal go to water dump and then into my dust collector. So I don't start any problems. Uh, this is my 52 South Bend lathe. Wow. This is this is what keeps me from moving. Uh, it that weighs is an about amazing machine. 1,600 pounds, something like that. So you can't get enough people around the, the, the lathe to move it. So you have to use an engine hoist or a forklift or whatever. But I like it. And it's, it actually ends up uh, reinforcing my, my leg vice. So I can really hammer on this thing and it doesn't go anywhere. What year is that uh, laid from? Because that's that's not something super recent. That's quite a Ni 1952. Quite... Yeah, exactly. That's a really nice machine. Holy shit! Yeah, it's uh... so that'll give you a better view of it if I can. I can't wow. see myself. You have so no idea how jealous I am of you having this. That's that's <laughs> a cool. That's it's a, a classic. Cool thing. It it's is. definitely a classic. But the the great thing about this when I bought it. Um, all the, all the old parts, the belts, uh, steady rests, all that. I have all the scrapers, which no one in the right mind would use scrapers anymore on a, on a, on a lathe bed, but yeah, I mean, it, it's fully original and it's never stopped working since 1952. We think that it might've been on a ship at some point because it has these really strange anchor plates 
It's actually um, very likely because these were used uh, in the marine quite a lot, huh? It's, it's yeah, yeah, like a sub or a uh, probably more of like a a larger navy ship would have something like this. But yeah, it's pretty. It's a cool one. It it just keeps going, man. You can't break these things. So that, that was um, before planned obsolescence. Yeah, yeah, that was that was a big thing for me, and I actually spent less on this than I would on like a Precision Matthews. So, um, which is what, sort of the pipe making standard. What brand was it? South Bend. Okay. Okay. So your, your big ones are going to be like South Bend, Atlas. Uh, you know, it kind of goes along with like the Bridgeport Mills thing. Basically old, old iron is what it's generally referred to. And I could technically between the mill and the lathe, I could make any part to the lathe or the mill. Yeah, which is kind of nice. I, I like I having that a, autonomy. I maybe have a weird question, but seeing, mm -hmm. I mean, I knew you had some metal working equipment, obviously, but seeing that you have a mill and a, uh, like um, a lathe, you know, these are very uh, comprehensive tools. With a lathe and a mill, you can make like a million things. Do you oh, ever yeah. see yourself? Uh, integrating this into your pipe making, like making uh, copper bands or metal bands or stuff like that. Do you see you integrating your metalwork and your woodworking together into creating a, a new product? Yeah, I mean, I've done I've done a lot of I've done titanium bands, I've done silver bands, copper, brass, uh, bronze. Um, I mean, that that smoke box was all the stuff was made on this lathe. I didn't even use a mill for that, so that was that was all machined out. Uh, all the bronze and stuff was done on this. Um, I what I've created here is what I call a prototyping shop. So this is not the shop is not meant for high production. This is meant to make one piece and to tinker and to play with ideas and stuff. And then also the blacksmithing takes place in here. Um, but it's it's not meant for production anymore. I, I just don't have the room. I mean, I have maybe four hundred square feet in here, and that's that's nowhere near enough. I need. 1500 2000 square feet to to properly do the kind of variety of things that I want to do. R room is a tricky favorite? thing because it's finite, you know. You, you can't, I can't make more room <laughs> in my shop. So do me a favor and quickly show your forge as well and then we can get back to all the pipe stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, I'm going <laughs> to So here's my hydraulic press. Um, this will this will do a 12 ton press for drawing, doing blades, doing uh, any sort of architectural work, stuff like that. Um, I need to grease it. All the heat lately kind of dried it out. Um, you, you got any warning signs for using those tools? <laughs> any warning signs? <laughs> you know, it's funny. One of my, uh, I think I just went blank for a second. Hold on. Um, one of my fellow uh, blacksmiths recently uh, had an accident on his press and crushed a few fingers and lost, lost, he lost a finger on a press like that. Cause I mean, 12 tons, that's, that's a lot of pressure. Um, yeah. They don't know. You just, it's yeah. like anything. Hey, John, if, please if you, do not try this at home. That's... No, don't do that. If, <laughs> if you pay attention, then it's safe. And there's a thing, there's a thing where, uh, there's a risk and then there's a likelihood of, or there's a risk and a uh, call an outcome, right? So certain things can be really dangerous, but not risky. And certain things can be really risky, but not dangerous. Please drink um, responsibly before operating this machinery. <laughs> yeah, we don't see when I was pipe making beers were welcome. We do not drink in the shop anymore with this stuff. Um, and then I have, you know, my, all my part cabinets and all that. Um, it's got everything from ivory that I can't use anymore to titanium to silver trinkets that I've got over the years that I incorporate into other projects. Um, let's see what else is here. This is every shape of the bones that has ever been in totes, broken down into basic shape uh, format. That's going into a catalog at some point, and then possibly a book if I can get myself motivated to do it. 
welder, plasma cutter on the bottom, uh, materials, powder steels, all that stuff over here. Got a uh, bandsaw, various quench tanks, my heated quench tank for carbon steels, propane, and here's the forge. So it's a hey, propane. Chris, is that, is that a 14 inch or, a, or a, what, what size uh, bandsaw you got there? That's a 14. That's a, the Raycon 14 Deluxe, I think they call it. Okay, cool. And I like it, but I really do wish that I had bought the Laguna. I, I think the Laguna is a higher quality product, personally. Uh, but Triple the price. <laughs> yeah, it's quite a, it's it's very prohibitively expensive, but they're they're nice tools. It's just pricey. So when I am forging, this is a totally different shop. Certain things get moved around. Uh, windows are all the way open. There's fans going. Um, and then towards the winter, I'll be moving probably the, the forge outside onto the deck and the anvil will be in here that way. That was a nice There's anvil. A, what's the brand Did of I... your forge? It looks like a BACMA, but I don't think they sell, sell them in uh, the US. No, so that's a, uh, that's a chili forge. I like the fact that it has dual burners. That's nice. What, what, what heat can you reach? maximum on gas i can forge weld easy in that that's nice so i mean that's, i'm i could probably 2400 i think it'll reach at full tilt and it's an atmospheric forge so you cannot block these because it'll explode <laughs> which kind of is a bummer but uh it, so that's it, why it, they know no fire bricks around because no fire bricks <laughs> no. of exploding no, you can't, you can't do that with a Venturi uh, burner setup, but it, it gives you pretty good heat. I'm looking at getting a induction forge at some point here. Did you cook that have like a, sorry, go ahead. So the induction forge for people that don't know is it's, it's a big, it looks like a computer tower and then it has a tube that comes out, coils and then goes back in. And you basically pass any, any piece of metal into that thing and it's cherry hot. I mean, ready to go within seconds and there's no heat except for that piece. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's really nicely localized. That's what makes it so nice. But they take nice. a lot of practice to run. Huh? Like you need to get the, 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 the wavelength exactly right to get it working. Yeah. I wonder if there Definitely. are any uh, culinary applications, you know, like a seven second ribeye. Maybe. <laughs> Something like that. Maybe. Half a second hot dogs. No, Michelle you can only it. hit metal. With induction forge, you can hit yeah. only metal. It will not it hit anything that's not metal. Yeah, it has to be metal. So you sprinkle a little gold foil on your steak, and then you throw it in there, you get a nice sear on it. <laughs> I have a crazy question. Yeah. Uh, do you have a shipping department? Do you handle everything yourself? I am 100% solo. I do everything. So you ship it, you, you do the works. Yeah. So the way that I do my business, and this is maybe, I don't know, we'll call it part of the, the, the mystery or the magic. I do not have employees. Uh, I do need employees. Like I need at least one employee. Uh, but I'd rather have partnerships where people have something to gain through their own hard work than someone who's basically going to work for me and take my money. Like Southwest um, Airlines. <laughs> <laughs> I, I prefer, I just prefer to have, I don't want the responsibility of, of making sure someone's family is fed first off, especially like right now. Um, and I also don't want them to have the responsibility of letting me down. Um, I do Good what idea. I do in a very particular way. Uh, some people will say <laughs> it's like lean manufacturing or whatever that equivalency is for running a business. But um, I want to maximize everyone's benefit who's associated with me. Uh, so my factory guys get paid top dollar for the work that they do. I get paid top dollar for the work I do. My uh, retailers have the most margin they possibly can for wholesale on a product like this. Uh, my distributors get their piece of the pie. So I, I like to keep it sort of a, a web, like a network of, of people that are working hard towards the same goal, but they own their own part of that 
network. Very good. Hey, Chris, um, uh, you mentioned uh, in the beginning that you passed on purchasing a CNC or you didn't want that suggestion. Uh, Oops, Rafael, I'm so sorry. I pushed the wrong button. I was trying to make you bigger, but you got to turn your mic back. There we go. Oh, there we go. Okay, so uh, you had mentioned you passed on on purchasing a CNC. Have you ever thought of incorporating a fourth axis, maybe on production, or if it's pipe, is, is that taboo on pipe making? Uh, in in pipe making, you'd be better off buying an existing phrasing machine. To be honest, um, there's rumors that certain companies have CNC machines. And that's how they do their work and cool. But a CNC machine capable of doing the work that you would need it to do. How do I put this? You can't run Briar on a machine that normally runs steel or something that needs coolant. Uh, you just can't. It, it immediately toxifies the machine. So if you, most people that have CNC setups, they'll outsource. So they'll be like, I have this great, $300,000 CNC machine. Do you need parts made? Send me some CAD files. I'll machine all your parts. And that's kind of how they pay for the machine because the machine has to pay for itself. And you're not going to do that uh, with, with making pipes on it. Because the other side of that is you have to make the pipes and then you have to finish them in-house, which is not cost effective, especially in, in where I live. Um, most people who are skilled enough to do that work would need like $75,000 a year. And that's very little compared to what a CNC machine shop makes. Like, I mean, these shops are bringing in a million dollars a month uh, in, in outsourcing. You run that machine 24 seven, if you can, you know, by law, if you can get that many shifts going. Uh, so the best bet that I would have is to, somehow find a CNC or a, find a phrasing machine, which is a mechanical device as opposed to a digital device. You know, it's, it's not using a computer program. You are literally putting a bowl on a peg and it's spinning and there's a stylus and it's feeling every contour and it is duplicating that four, five, six, ten, thirty 10, 30 times down the line. It's also a very big piece of equipment. So Thanks we've got about um, 20 minutes or so in the regular group seat. Chris, I told you this time goes by so fast. Yeah, that was fine. Can, I, I want to not miss the opportunity to talk about meats. And we talked a lot about um, your forge, but like the products you make out of the forge, I think there's a bunch of people who just don't know a whole lot about your knives and um, mm -hmm. speaking for myself. And, and and the jerky. So um, let's do that uh, chronologically. Like, when did you get into the next phase after the pipes? Uh, what was the next I, product you made? Um, well, I, I started doing the, I took a course on blacksmithing uh, maybe two, was it two years ago? And then started equipping myself. And uh, as luck would have it, I have lots of friends that ended up that I didn't know were blacksmiths uh, around me in, in my network. I mean, I've, I've got like five people ranging from my age all the way up to 90 um, who are full-time blacksmiths that still produce. I mean, George actually, he lives up on the hill um, and he was, uh, he, he also does repose work, which is where you take a big piece of pitch and you sp uh, put your copper plate or your steel plate over it and you're sitting there with a hammer and a chisel pulling and moving the steel to where you could make a mask or you could make a freaking seagull or whatever like it, it's it is the tippity tippity top of blacksmithing skill i mean it it's insane the the kind of work that some of the top dogs can do with that um and i i think at that point i started realizing like i could actually do this um, it's not a financially viable platform for a job because who the hell needs a $6,000 copper steeple for their old Victorian home? You know, it's, it's one of those things where you're going to get some people commissioning really cool stuff and it's going to be really expensive. And then you'll make a knife that you spent like 20 hours on and they're like, I'll give you 200 for it. 
you know, and that, that becomes a problem. Um, so I think the, the best way that I can absorb it or, or carry it with me at the moment is just to say, this is a really expensive hobby that I got myself into and it's fun and I enjoy it. And it's, it's actually very good exercise. Um, it's essentially ballistic training. Like you're sitting there, bah, 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 you know, fast movements with heavy things and it's really good for your joints <laughs> and you're, you know, so it's, uh, that's when I started doing that. And I've been doing that for seriously for a little over a year now. Um, and I like it. I, I enjoy it. It's, it's a, it's a nice stress reliever and it, it kind of takes me out of everything. Cause when you're handling, you know, an 1800 degree piece of steel, that is what you need to pay attention to. And, uh, if you don't, you know, you get burns and I mean, I've gotten some pretty serious burns. I had a third degree burn on my wrist, uh, ended up almost cauterizing some veins when I did it. Uh, and it's, it's always, it's always a little sketchy, but, uh, shortly after that, I started actually it was around the same time. I think the meets came about, I, I hooked up with a company down in, in, uh, Southern California and I started talking to them they're like, do you want, like, we could run off some beef jerky for you. You know, you can make it your recipe and do all this stuff. And I'm like, well, I don't want to do my recipe right now. We'll, we'll, we'll run with your recipe and we'll kind of private label it just, just for fun. You know, and it, it was just some, kind of a, you know, a, a silly thing to have like, Hey, you can buy a pipe and some jerky on my site. And it's, it's, it's a very good jerky. It's tender. It's not too salty. It's, it's very, low sugar, which is uh, ideal for me. Cause I don't like a lot of really sweet sticky type stuff. So yeah, that's pretty much it. I mean, it like, it, coffee shows, you know, tobacco and coffee. Exactly. Tobacco and jerky. Exactly. Yeah. And I, a lot of, a lot of my customer bases, uh, a lot of them are outdoorsmen. Um, I have a gigantic military, uh, like servicemen following. And that's always kind of fun because they can order that and have it shipped to them and, you know, they can hide it from their friends <laughs> for a certain amount of time. <laughs> but I, I just, I like if it, if I can, with the jerky, it pays for itself. The jerky is a, is a nonprofit essentially. It's, it's very tricky to get that done and there's not a lot of money in it, but um, it's enjoyable. And I, I think that the more, enjoyment and creativity I can bring to my existing customer base, the better. I, I can see the military customers, you know, I mean, if, if you're going to be in the field, uh, a bones is perfect for that. Jerky is perfect for that. I got to look yeah. at that tomahawk you were producing. Uh, perfect. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I didn't, I, I didn't even know that you did the knives. I, a week ago I was on a mission. I went to your site. I bought the pipe. I didn't, I didn't peruse the rest of it. Those three Serbian cleavers are all sold out. Those are beautiful. When do you expect to have those back in? David, you opened up the knife chat. So <laughs> you you can, I'm, I'm fully open for commissions. I, I, I don't give an ETA. That's, that's the one thing that I, I will not do. I'll not say, hey, this will be ready next week. But if someone is interested, I can put their name on a list. They can pay a little deposit, which is refundable. And, uh, you know, I can... If you have a crazy idea, anything, I can do anything under, under 18 inches. So right. if someone wanted a, you know, a mini machete, I could do that. I've done chavetas, which are the cigar rollers knives. Uh, I just did a, a copper uh, charcuterie set for like cheeses and stuff where I forged a copper uh, knife and a copper fork that came with like a leather sheath for a friend of mine. So I'm, I'm pretty much open. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, it's hard for me to find time to produce batches of knives right now because uh, it's just so damn hot here. But uh, once winter rolls around, I'll be in here a lot more and have, have more time to put things on the site. So like I said, expensive hobby. <laughs> I might, I might have a t-shirt you might like, because you were talking about your burns and I always tell people when they come by for a workshop or something, it's not what, if you get burned, it's when and how bad. Oh yeah. And, a friend of mine actually gave me a t-shirt that said non-flammable challenge accepted. I think that would look good on you, Chris. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. The burns are weird. And there's a, there's a saying 
among blacksmiths and, and uh, steel, anyone who works with steel is uh, if it's, if it's black, don't touch it because it is, man, there, the, the amount of time that it will take for you to notice how hot something is when it's red is very quickly. I mean, you will <laughs> notice immediately you'll feel the sizzle. It, it, it'll release. You won't say it won't stick to you. And it's really quite forgiving when something is, is even a little red. Uh, if you touch something that is like 750 degrees and you grip that because you think it's cold and you pick it up your tongs or something, it will mm. burn you so much worse because your, your mind doesn't connect the two. It's a weird science thing or psychology thing. Um, and I, I got burned, man, I got burned so bad last year. Um, I, I had the tip of my tongs and I wasn't paying attention. I had them laying by my side and I was doing the Damascus at the time. So the forge was crazy hot and I rested the tip of the tongs on my calf and it actually burned through the skin and it started burning into the muscle part portion. And thankfully it healed. Uh, the wrist one was really bad. I mean, it, it's not paying attention is what causes those. So I, I just want to um, open this up. The, I can see we have a lot of people, a lot of gentlemen who, who, who are members of the, of the, club who come and and support the club and hang out and don't talk a whole lot and, and again to to remind everybody you don't need to we're just we're you know everyone is welcome but i also want to make sure that everybody got their questions asked or you know toss their their coming through the ring so now's a great time to do that if you've been holding on to a question or if you want to dig into something we haven't chatted about yet um uh, throw it out there. We got we got time right now. I don't have so much of a question, but more of a statement. As you were saying, Chris, I think you said the their seconds, the briar, mm -hmm. um, from whatever factory. And I have I just went on months ago and bought a random bent shape. It's awesome, mm -hmm. chubby cutty, and cool. I can see that it was like perfect it's all bird's eye you know it's sweet and then here comes the reason i bought it big pit big sand pit yeah it's awesome looks like why would you throw jupiter yeah seriously um but it's a shame that they were throwing stuff like this into the fire because it's still like a hundred percent smokable it's an excellent smoker and I'm glad that some somebody can make use of them. Um, I appreciate that you are finding uh, these things and making them available to us. So uh, that is exactly what I thought when, when when I got mine out. You know, I was looking at the grain; it's absolutely beautiful. And then I turn it around, and oh my God, I love that thing! Look at that, like perfect. The other, There's the some... other, the subtle difference is I know no one else. Every you know, the chubby cutty was available for a while, but I know mm -hmm. nobody has this one. Yeah, that's a big. I'm like a, big a Savinelli or something. I've got a, a pit bull, and check out that right there. Yeah, it, and, and nobody it's, else it's has cool. that. No, it's unique. I yeah, love I it. I love it's, it's wood. It's supposed to be that way. Yeah, yeah. but. The thing is, a lot of people don't feel that way. They they do they do not feel that way. They look at them and they're like, "Oh, I I, I need you to send me one without flaws." I'm like, "Well, these have flaws, so they might not yeah. be the right fit for you." Um, you know, I, I don't I never ever will say that bones smoke better than other pipes, but there is a little lizard brain thing that we all have, and it's called value recognition. You know, and, and a lot of people don't don't look at it that way. People that run businesses, they don't look at the value or the perceived value of an item. And people always want to get more for their money than they're than they're originally spending. And uh, I think with bones, you're you're you are getting a second. You're getting something that would otherwise be destroyed or possibly filled with that nasty pink putty and and covered with varnish and it just, you know, you're like, you smell it and it has that chemical smell. Some of them, not all of them. Um, and some people like those and they, they like the old timiness. I mean, uh, pipes 
have always been tools. They've only recently become gentlemen's accoutrement. You know, they, yeah. they, they've always been a tool. I have all my grandfather's pipes. They got pink putty. They, they're like all dinged up. You can maybe fit like a golf tee down in it. I mean, it's so caked up and disgusting and I won't smoke them, uh, but I have them here and they're a nice reminder of what a pipe is supposed to be. It, it is, it can be many things. What's it supposed to be? It's supposed to smoke. It's supposed to offer you some sort of solace from your otherwise boring, stressful. Uh, maybe your life is too fast paced and this is your moment to calm down and chill, or maybe it's your moment to, associate with people that are like you you know uh, how many of us uh, i don't know how many are in this chat right now because i'm only seeing four at a time but how many of us will share our thoughts about the hobby and people are like people still do that you know or really like who smokes a pipe anymore that's such an old an old man thing or that's such a you know my grandfather smoked a pipe but you know, then we found out that it's bad for you or, or whatever the reason is for being surprised by the fact that you smoke a pipe. Imagine what it's like telling that you're a pipe maker. That's fun. <laughs> yeah. you know, it, it's funny so, because. Um, Chris, just to let you know, between the um, guys who are here right now and the guys over there on YouTube, we have about 60 some uh, people in the meeting today. Wow. Um, so uh, I'm just really delighted by that. I love the fact That's that we great. get a chance to, to meet you and, and everybody's going to get a chance to, to get to know you better. Um, yeah. uh, Todd, you had a question, then, then I wanted to ask about the ones. Okay. No, I just, I, I, I've made the comment here before. Uh, Chris, you are the only other person in Santa Clara County, Silicon Valley, that I know. That's There's one in Los Gatos. There's another guy, but he's not very talkative. <laughs> Well, I, I've made the you know, you know Silicon Valley, right? And I've I've yeah, said, yeah. you know, it's a, it's 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 probably a good thing that uh, this hobby hasn't caught on in Silicon Valley because if the hipsters ever got a hold of this, it would spread like wildfire. They would deplete the supply of tobacco overnight, and true. we'd all be paying you know fifty bucks for a tin. That's uh, true. And it's just, um, yeah, I, I'm I am surprised that it has not caught on here, it, I guess so is what there, I'm saying. There was a dream for a lot of people that the hipster uprising, however you want to call it, would would uh, absorb what the bubble bursting took away, if that makes sense. So when all the prices started dropping again, uh, people were like, it's fine. We got hipsters. We got these suspender, you know, wherein, you know, uh, you know, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Sort of like the the quintessential hipster, which I participated in for a time. I had a handlebar mustache and the whole bit, and I just got tired of the upkeep. But um, people thought that that was going to be the next big thing. But you have to look at the background and the, the demographic itself. Who is doing those things? These are people that are attending college, possibly. Uh, these are not people that have higher degrees, that have very high paying jobs, that are able to spend you know, $5,000 on a pipe, uh, their product or their uh, direction is the image and the lifestyle. It's not a hobby for them. It is who they are. You know, they want to wear their bespoke clothing and they participate in bands that uh, they go to concerts in, in like basements because that is the point of it. No one knows about this band and I get to be one of the very first to watch them perform. And it's, it's not a very, uh, conducive environment for selling really expensive posh pipes you know the that market has generally always gone towards people that are fanatical about pipes uh regardless of financial demographic and people that have a ton of money who want something you know who are at that elite sort of uh buying level they have their nice motorcycle collection they have their nice pipe collection they buy really expensive wine um and no market is better than the other or really in any way worse than the other it's just uh it's knowing your your customer base and i i found to kind of put that into simple terms i, I found that i'm I'm, a, I'm much happier selling a 39 dollar pipe at the moment to a couple thousand people a year than i am selling uh, a two thousand dollar pipe to fifty people a year. 
plain and simple. It comes down to happiness for me. And I, I think that the customer base is happier with, with my new position. That was probably more than that, than that comment needed. <laughs> Sorry. No, I, mean, I, I guess the, 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 the contrast, what am I looking for? What's the word? I, I'm, I'm sure you've seen, uh, you know, like at Santana Po, they've got a, that cigar store. Yeah. And, uh, you know, this, I, and I used to smoke cigars, but kind of like, you know, the lifestyle, I would spend 40 bucks on a, on a Padron Anniversario. You know, one cigar. I mean, that's that's one of your pipes. That's like you know, uh, four or five tins of tobacco, yeah. three tins of tobacco. You know, and and uh, but that people would spend like that. You know, the 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 pipe tobacco and the pipes themselves, especially with something like a bones, the price point is so much lower. It's so much more affordable. Yeah, and and more goes into it. More physical labor goes into pipes than than cigars. To, to a certain degree. Mar uh, cigars have always inherently had a very heavy marketing cost. Um, there's a there's sort of a, a joke among the cigar club guys here and me with with uh, Gurkha. And, uh, you know, Gurkha is known to be the kings of marketing and they have all this great stuff and they come in a cool box with copper and like all this really neat stuff on it. Uh, I attended a, a very fancy uh, guy's hangout uh, years ago, uh, were, were the, <laughs> I still can't wrap my head around this. I met the inventor of the, uh, the, uh, ready pack salad and, and like the bagged lettuce, like all the stuff that you, when you buy, like anything bagged, like any of that new produce that's bagged, like, Hey, I need a spinach salad and it's bagged. So he invented the process and the guy gets, I mean, he's making like hundreds of millions of dollars a year because he owns the patents and all this stuff. And he wanted to throw a party to show Gurkha. He bought a box of Gurkha HMRs. It was a $16,000 box of cigars. And he's passing them all out to people. I'm like, I don't want one. Like just as a personal thing, like I will pocket this thing and like auction it off for charity. Like I can't smoke this. It's just, it's beyond the realm of my comprehension why anyone would do that personally. Um, I don't damn anyone for doing it, but I sat back and I had a great time watching people smoke thousands of dollars of cigars all at once. And uh, I can tell you one thing, they didn't smell any better. Uh, <laughs> there were guys that were sitting there shoving their reamer down the middle, their draw tools. One guy had one that was completely unraveling and he was like, I don't understand what's going on here. And I was like, well, science, if you take tobacco, which naturally can bind to itself because it has a natural binder in it and you stick it in alcohol, which is going to dissolve that glue. It's not going to stick to itself anymore. So why is the stick $700, you know? And anyway, fast forward, the guy, he, he was a good time drinking. Uh, he brought, he bought a whole case of shipwreck, literally shipwreck rum that he bought at auction somewhere. I mean, the, the, it was the craziest thing I've ever seen. These bottles were like 500 years old and he's, they're sitting there with their buddies drinking this like unobtainable rum and he gets up on the table. He stands on this probably $25,000, like beautiful gourd, you know, a cigar, cigar lounge, like beautiful furniture. He's standing on this table and he's cussing Gurkha out to everyone in the room. Like, I want to show you guys how shitty this company is and like how much marketing is involved. He takes the box I don't know if I've ever talked about this publicly. He takes the box. The box alone for the HMR is a piece of amazing craftsmanship. It is gorgeous. It has probably an eighth of an inch of just clear uh, French polish on it. I mean, it's it's amazing. You would They go for like $2,000 on their own when you can find them. And he puts it on the barbecue and he douses it in lighter fluid and lights it on fire. And I just sat there and my soul was dying watching this thing and to put that into perspective it kind of taught me something about who the buyers are for these cigars and who the buyers are for the pipes you have people that are reselling what essentially would be a very heavily smoked 39 dollars pipe and they're selling it to a buddy for 15 bucks to pass along that friendship and every every ounce of, of what you have as a pipe smoker is valued. Whereas 
I think maybe because of demographics or because of the perceived image of who you need to be to smoke expensive cigars, a lot of that is just wasted. And it kind of goes along with what bones are in the first place. They are waste. They are a by byproduct of an industry and they've just been reused to access a market that has been largely forgotten in, in our business for the past 50 years, you know? Well, like I said, it's brilliant. It, it is. is. Can we talk about the one, the one pie? Yeah, let's, let's, let's do it. it. Sorry, sorry, David. I know we've been trying to get to this. <laughs> oh, this is, um, yeah, I'm, I'm only here to like keep the flow going. These yeah. questions are why we're here is letting everybody else ask questions and talk about it. But I, I think it's, it's really interesting. So this is kind of like your newest, uh, newest product, right? And um, yeah, we'll hear more about it. So the one series happened, like most things, uh, out of a mistake. I told you guys before, like, I love fixing things. Uh, that's kind of, I get my giddies, you know, fixing things. And it, it gives me a great sense of uh, purpose. And the Bones line is kind of the beginnings of that. But I ended up, uh, I ended up getting an accidental shipment, a very, 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 very large shipment of really small clocks. I don't have one here, but we're talking like a briar block that I normally buy is about this big, you know, if I'm making a handmade pipe, if I'm doing factory stuff, you know, they come in and they're about that big and they're different shapes and stuff. These blocks were so freaking tiny. Like, I think they were maybe three inches long, if that, and maybe an inch and a half wide, probably not even that, probably an inch wide. They were these dinky, dinky little blocks. and it came to me wet, right? And it was a, it was a total mistake. Um, and I had maybe a hundred or 200 of them. And I was like, well, what do I even do with these? Cause I'm not shipping them back. Shipping briars, crazy expensive. You end up paying like a dollar per block to ship it. And uh, so I said, okay, well, let's see what kind of pipe we can make out of this. I started thinking like, well, there have been briar stemmed pipes. You know, I've seen those. What is the most pure form of the pipe you can imagine? I was going through the Alfred Dunhill book and I started seeing these designs of, of different ethnic and regional pipes that just didn't have stems. You know, clay pipes don't have stems. They are a clay pipe. The whole thing is one unit. And I started thinking like, well, maybe we just do like a solid briar pipe. And it's just like an old codger type thing. You know, the dude that's fly fishing or Maybe he's just wants a real quick intermission style pipe and he wants to, uh, you know, he, he, he wants something quality and it is a handmade product. The, the one series is, is actually hand shaped uh, because it's too small for the machinery to even do anything with it, uh, which hence, hence the cost. Um, and the margin of error is significantly higher on the one series because the walls are thinner. Uh, it has a smaller airway. So if there is a pit, there's actually going to be far more waste, which ends up creating the bones, uh, the one bone series, which I'll tell you about in a minute. So uh, I started making, I made maybe 40 of them in house and sold them. And they went like hotcakes. I mean, we're talking, this was probably even before blackjack, I was making these. And they sold for, I think, 125 a piece. And then I dropped the price to a hundred a piece and they were sold even crazier. And I couldn't, I couldn't handle that volume. I mean, it was just, there was no way they, they took a good amount of time and uh, ended up uh, once again, passing it off to my guys in Italy and, and they loved it. And they thought it was such a cool, unique novelty again. Uh, and they started working on them and that became the one series. It is, it's designed to fit, uh, not everyone wears jeans, but it is designed to fit in the jeans coin pocket, like on your jeans. It fits right in there perfectly. Uh, and then that combined with a uh, flapjack, you can uh, be basically good to go all day. And that, that was the whole design. It's, it's a cohesive, it's called a modular setup. You know, you mix and match, grab a bones in your flapjack, grab a briar cigar in your flapjack. And you have your uh, tool and your your container at the same time. So then, what's the deal with the uh, the bones ones? So again, coming out of a, a funny mistake, 
uh, we, one of the, one of the lines or one of the orders that when I put through, they, they got the wrong size blocks in the order. Some of them were the right size, some of them were the wrong size. And they're like, well, we only have maybe 75 or a hundred of the right sized block for this. And I was like, well, that's not going to work. He's like, well, we could wait a couple more months till there's more harvested and we have more dried. I was like, you know what? Find, find some, like, let's come up with a, a, a way to do this. And the, the blocks weren't as clean as I would normally like them. So they ended up coming up with the idea to just snip them all at the same length and throw an actual stem on it. And what was weird about that is a lot of the people that bought the original one series said, I just wish it had a stem. Um, I prefer it without a stem because over time your, your teeth will sink into it and create a perfect negative and it'll just sit there forever. And it feels like there's nothing. Um, but some guys wanted a stem. And so we gave them that option. Uh, they were already laser engraved as bones, unfortunately. Uh, and I found that as a positive because that's another skew. It's another product and another um, bit of interesting thing that we can go go into and just say, hey, this has got a few more flaws, but you do have a stem, five bucks less, it's sold it. I mean, people were really excited about that product. And so those are available now? They are not, they're sold out. I have more one series coming, but like our Butis bones, those are not gonna pop up on the regular, uh, the bones version of the one series is not gonna pop up on the regular, but one will be available the Briar cigars coming in. I have more bones coming. Uh, I'm my plan, and uh, you know, don't hold me to this, but my plan is to do a gigantic Black Friday deal uh, if I can. I can't guarantee that, but uh, I like doing my mystery pack deals. I get to put all kinds of cool stuff, and people open them and they're like, "Oh my God, what is this weird?" You know, there's six rolls of pennies in this thing, and like a hundred dollar gift card or you know, uh, every package, I guess for people that don't know what I'm talking about, I, I run a deal that I kind of created in my own fashion where I'll go around the shop and I'll put all kinds of weird stuff uh, in these poly bags, like, like this. And uh, I'll put all kinds of strange stuff. So like this one, I have no idea what's in this one. I don't want to rip it open, but I would say there's, there's at least a pipe in every single pouch. And usually there's something else. Sometimes there'll be like a tamper. Sometimes uh, I think I put a watch in one of them, like a wristwatch. Uh, I put money in them. Uh, the only thing I, I want to put in is like, you know, I thought it'd be cool to put like silver coins or something, but it's illegal to ship silver coins to most countries. So I can't do that. Um, I put knives in them. Uh, because we're already dealing with the 21 plus age group. So I figure that's okay. I put uh, flapjacks, anything on the site, past or present. Um, I've put handmade pipes. I've put prototypes of certain things that I've come out with later. I've put um, S hooks that I've forged, uh, all, all kinds of random things, but there's always a pipe in it. So it's always worth at least 39 bucks. There's at least a bones at the very bare minimum in every pack. So what I do for you to access that is you spend, uh, usually the price points about 129, sometimes it's 139 and you spend 139, you can buy whatever you want on the site and you automatically qualify for a pack. And I've had prize packs, uh, that have been well over a thousand dollars. Um, and I don't ever mention that. I usually say 750 is the big pack and that'll have a handmade pipe, two bones, a flapjack. It'll be like the big jackpot one. And everyone's always searching for the big one. The funny thing is I've only received word back from two of the big packs. And I don't know where like, a lot of these guys are not YouTube people. A lot of these guys are not Instagram people. Um, some guys don't want to gloat and they don't want to show all the cool stuff that they got. But uh, this one's got some high ticket items in it. I mean, I kind of went, I don't even remember because I've been building these bags for the past like five months. We should book you now for November so that you can come on and talk about it. <laughs> I'll do it. Yeah, that's fine. All right. 
Well, yeah, um, I, we had some time still. I still have to like get my, I, I usually try to pack about three or 400 bags just so I have them. And then I roll it over when the deal's over onto the next one. We're at the time when I usually say, oh, Lowell's got, look at that. Hail call. <laughs> Where is he? Oh, there you go. Missouri Mersham hardwood. Yeah. Oh, it's a hardwood. I thought it was. Yeah, I just got it in the mail. <laughs> you know, I've never, I've never smoked one of those. I've, I've, I have probably fifty or sixty cobs in my shop, and I've never smoked a hardwood. Me either. It's going to be a first. David, real quick, uh, uh, I, I know we're over time. Uh, Dennis, earlier you you had a question, and I know you didn't get to it. I was curious as to what that might have been, if you still had it or not. Oops. It says you're you're unmuted, Dennis, but I still can't hear you. How about now? There you go. Where do I go? <laughs> well, you said yeah, you go. There you go. All right, all right. Uh, uh, Chris, I just wanted to point out a couple things. First, as you can see, yeah, I love it. Secondly, oh. I smoked this thing for what was it now? Uh, an hour and ten minutes. And that sucker was nice and smooth all the way through. Wow. Secondly, uh, you made a comment earlier about people who collect weird shit. And yeah. you'll note know the upper level is corn cobs, the bottom level is briars. But you made a comment about ham radio. Ham operators. radio. Nice. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and, and so, uh, yeah, the value is there, boss. And I appreciate it. And Believe it or not, I first heard of you from Corn Cop Nation. Wow. They were the guys who started showing off their bones pipes on Corn Cop Nation. Nicely cool. done, boss. You found a market. You found a market that even cobbers like. Yeah. <laughs> you know I, apparently so. You know how cheap we are. All right, I'm done. <laughs> no, I, I appreciate that, Dennis. And uh, it's funny that again back at you with the, the ham thing i was looking into getting my operator license i don't even know why i was just like that sounds fun you know but we'll see at some point i've been november 9 india kilo lima since 1970 wow uh chris and maybe yes, anybody sir. else could answer this question too uh is there a way to slow down the uh, coloring of the bones pipes no Sorry, <laughs> that's uh, there. I've I've been asked that so many times. The only thing I can think of is lining the bowl with uh, meerschaum. That's that's probably the only way to do it, and even that wouldn't halt it. But there was a, a lot of discussion over the past few years uh, that and at different. We'll call it at different upper levels of the business that briar does not breathe and it absolutely does it doesn't breathe like it's air it breathes in a capillary effect right so it was a living water moving body before it was cut and dried and, and all that um you oh, can well. still you can still smoke a bones pipe and the tars will color from the inside out and it takes a long time uh, but it works, it would work fairly similar to a meerschaum. A meerschaum you have, it can move everywhere. You know, the, the, the tars can move wherever there's less heat. Heat is the, is the enemy of meerschaums, by the way. If you get a hot spot, it'll clear that area of color and you'll ruin uh, your fancy colored meerschaum pipe. That's why they have coloring bowls. But anyway, back to Briar. Um, Briar doesn't work the same way. You can smoke it hot and it will end up coloring, but if you touch the outside, you're getting tars and oils and stuff from your hands. Uh, there was a joke with, to reference Corn Cob Nation, uh, Kaylee, the queen of cobs, put up a video a while back that she had been smoking her bones pipe forever and it wasn't coloring. I was like, well, you're a chick, you have clean hands. Us dirty, grubby old guys, you know, we're touching <laughs> these pipes and, the, you know, it's like I changed the oil on my truck and now I'm smoking this pipe and look, it's coloring. Um, it's it goes from the inside and the outside but halting it i have not found an effective method of doing that yeah todd asked hey. me i put up a, a picture of i also got the, the the little ants which i love 
you can see how fast this color. I've only had this like three weeks and it's already yeah. that dark. So they do color up really, really rapidly. And I was going to ask you exactly how long did it take to do that? Hardly at any time at all. Like within the first week, I was already noticing um, some some nice spots of color and it just spread everywhere. It's just, it's really consistent. Lowell's got one there that's practically black. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it changes. It depends on... It depends on a lot of factors. That, and that's one thing that I try to remind people of with pipe making, even when you try to control everything in your hand making a pipe, there are factors upon factors and variables that you don't even know about that are at play. You cannot reproduce two pipes to smoke exactly the same, even if they're the exact same dimensions. Um, there, there could have been a beetle that nibbled on this particular wood uh, when it was being grown 50, 60 years ago and the wood happen to create a defense and make that part of the briar denser mm -hmm. that you wouldn't even know about. You'd never know about this. Um, and so getting close enough is essentially what you're doing is, as making, you know, at make when you're making a pipe. Uh, and I guess what I was trying to point out before too, is there are people that smoke one blend in that pipe and it will turn one shade. And they'll do that in all their bones and they'll turn the same shade usually. Uh, I have one customer that's smoking, been smoking his since the first week uh, I, I offered them. He bought one of the original bones and this thing is fire engine red. I'm not kidding at all. Like it's, it's like that color, but darker. And he, he just doesn't, I mean, it, it just keeps coloring that way and it keeps getting deeper and richer. And I have guys that will smoke their bones and they'll turn black, you know, and it's just, it depends on what you smoke, how you handle it. Uh, I just put up a post, I think three days ago of a customer that does not touch the bowl ever. He only touches the stem and it shows that the briar will color, it colors very evenly. And it gets this really like, like a walnut sort of warmth to it. Uh, so it, it, you know, it's however you do it. And there's no wrong way or right way. This is supposed to be about fun and relaxation and I think it makes it easier that it's a, a less expensive pipe. There's no, you know, there's, there's no stress about it. I am going to um, get back to my, uh, my girls. Is there, uh, right. any, so I, I sense that the that fellows would want to hang out a little bit longer. Chris, you are absolutely welcome to hang out as long as you can, or as long as you um, want to, but I'm sure. going to, uh, Oliver, are you hanging out? For a while, let me pass over the the, uh, the co-hosting to you. So this is something that we do for those of you who, who might be uh, new this week. Um, the the meetings are, you know, trying to uh, be a good long time for us to hang together, but not you know take all you know dominate your whole weekend. So what we did uh, over the last couple of weeks, we had a lot of people say, "Well, I'd like to stick around longer than two hours. Can we do that?" So now, as of last week. Um, the pipe club meeting will go on as long as there are guys in the room. Nice. So, um, but I uh, made a promise to my partner that I would uh, get back together with the rest of the family after two hours. So I'm turning sure. the, um, the control. I appreciate it, David. Well, here's the thing. I, first of all, I just want to say on behalf of the whole club, this has been amazing and you've got a lot. There, just, just a little background. So Chris and I got on the phone just before the pipe club meeting and he goes, I don't know if I can hang for two hours. I think we're going to be done in 15 minutes. I don't have that much to talk about. And, <laughs> and you can see that he's got a lot more to share than that. And, and most likely stuff that we haven't even touched on yet. And um, I just want to say thank you so much for the generosity of your time. That's of course. Thank you. And we'd love to have you back. And I'm serious about having you come back maybe in November so that we can talk about, you know, your, um, your Black Friday or anything else that you've got about to, to launch around that time, that'd be awesome. Cool. Yeah, yeah. If I've got if I've got enough to talk about, I'll I'll definitely come back. You don't want to hear me still blather about the same thing though. <laughs> I don't think we're gonna have a problem in in dragging some uh, some new stories out of you because I think that there's a, you know, again for those of you who, lots of things that that I discovered about Chris in just like five minutes. The numbers of other um, master craftsmen that he's had a chance to study with. The, the people that he knows in the industry, some of the experiences that he's had in conceiving, 
bringing to market and then becoming successful with like there's a lot more that chris has it's, all, it's all it's all a crap shoot man it's it's right timing and and what do you call that uh never giving up <laughs> stubborn being stubborn maybe <laughs> so fantastic yeah, it's no, so I'm, I'm, I'm very say, very happy to be here i'm gonna say thank you and and bow out gentlemen don't leave on my account and i mean that seriously stick around there's lots more to, to talk about i love you very much and Take care, david guys have a great Thanks, week David. i will see you next saturday All right. thank you sir thanks man i'm gonna probably run inside for two minutes and i'll be back out for a bit okay. hey, chris, you thank you chris oliver you have the con sir all right i will yeah chris i have a question sure uh, i'm ordering one of those pipes does it have to be paypal yeah Currently, I'm, okay. I'm only doing PayPal, and that's honestly it has the only reason is because I have to have a process when I ship, and if I'm mm -hmm. pulling it from credit cards and all kinds of other stuff, it it's, becomes a nightmare. Okay, I was just wondering. Yeah, but I'll I'll be back in. Uh, give me two minutes. I'll be back. You guys go ahead and speak amongst yourselves. I'm, I'm gonna stay on here, but I'll I'm gonna run inside. And Josh from from St. Paul. Um, yes, I, I sense that you uh, wanted to show something maybe with. Re well, re somebody, re somebody had color. mentioned the Yeah, somebody had mentioned the coloring aspect. Yeah, that was me. And, um, you know, you can't stop the coloring, obviously. And but what I've found is most of the color, from my experience, because I'm not an everyday smoker. And so the, my hands, the oil from my hands are what's influencing that this um, capped calabash. Um, I wanted, just because of the shape, I liked, I liked it lighter. And one of the things that I've done with this pipe is I've, um, I've coated it with an extra layer of uh, carnauba wax and, and periodically I'll throw some more wax on it to try to slow down the oil from my hands, you know, getting onto the outside of the briar. Um, whereas this one, I put Mahoney's woodworking uh, butcher block conditioner on it and it darkens it right away um, sometimes too dark so that's just kind of the difference you can't stop the coloring but adding that extra layer of protection on the outside at least slows it down if that makes sense yeah now you're brushing it on or are you uh, using powder i have a buffing wheel i have a buffing wheel and so i just have a block of carnauba that i'll that i'll apply you know to the buffing wheel and then uh, buff it out. Gotcha. So okay, thanks. I have a question. You have uh, you put only one layer of canuba wax on it, or a couple layers? I so on this one, actually, and I probably need to do it again. Um, I'll just periodically recoat it because you know your pipe gets hot, and I actually smoke mine probably hotter than I should, so that wax melts, and then that's exposing it to your hand oil again. Uh, at least that's my theory. And what you'll notice on bones, and I've seen people talk about it, is when they finish the stem, this bottom portion right here tends to color last because it leaves quite a layer of, of wax on it. And so I was like, well, what if I just take that concept and just apply it to the whole pipe? So that's essentially how I've kept this one lighter. Um, but that was just me. So that was just one idea. I'm not a professional by any means, but um, it seems like it's helped slow down the coloring if that's something you're going for. Okay. Thank you, my friend. Absolutely. I've learned so much through this community and uh, I'm somewhat of a newbie myself. And, you know, Bones was my first introduction to actually briar pipes as a whole. And, uh, and it's, it's been really, really enjoyable. And it's actually, you know, got me tinkering on my own. Um, and so it's, it's kind of fun. So now I'm, you know, I make my own little tampers now. And <laughs> oh, uh, like it was just, yeah, it's just fun little things that it's kind of, you know, even though it's a factory pipe, um, because of the community and the different things people are doing, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's awakened a little bit of that in me, which, um, you know, and that value goes way beyond just smoking a pipe. So that's what I think is really cool. Yeah, you, you young smokers are uh, pretty lucky nowadays with the internet. It's back when I got yeah. started, it'll be 50 years I've been smoking a pipe in December. 
Uh, back then, we didn't have all that. <laughs> we had yeah. mail order catalogs and stuff like that, and that was about it. Marty Paul, but it's you, he had a, he had a but, it, but it's you, it's you old timers that are giving us the head start. So we we yeah. appreciate the uh, the legacy. <laughs> And, you know, they were talking earlier about uh, the younger ones and the hipsters um, in the in the great Midwest. It probably is different from the coast, whereas there's still uh, the hipsters that are um, coming up in the in the hobby around here anyway. And where are you from? Illinois. Oh, I grew up in Illinois. So I, oh, yeah? I, I'm in. Yeah, I'm in Minnesota now. I grew up in uh, okay. central Illinois, a couple hours out of Chicago. Yeah, well, we're, I'm in Clinton, if you know where that is. Um, yeah, I'm familiar with Clinton. I, um, I grew up an hour north of Peoria in the Quad Cities, um, Princeton, uh, LaSalle, Peru area. Ah, yeah, I know. I Quad know. City Mallards. <laughs> Old hockey team. I'm a hockey nut. <laughs> I'm a Blues That's fan. Right. We yeah, the well, and they played the Quad City Mallards. Yeah. And we went up to the Quad Cities to see them at the arena up there. And that's a nice area. I like it up there. Yeah, they've yeah, got Lowell, some great history. Lowell likes there, hockey too. a little bit. A little bit. Yeah, <laughs> just a bit. A little bit. As you can see behind <laughs> me, that's all my hockey. <laughs> so I, I had to run inside and get some fried chicken from last night because I was starving. So <laughs> sorry. Not to be rude. I got to eat. <laughs> yep. I just got done with lunch myself. Well, Chris, I, I really appreciate it too because. Um, you do really well on these and I, and I know uh, you give your time very freely, um, but it's kind of cool because, you know, so, you know, obviously some of the, the stories and the history, you know, which doesn't change. Uh, and so, you know, you, you kind of, you hear a lot of that over and over again, as I've followed you uh, the last couple of years, but, um, but it's, it's kind of cool because a little bit more comes out every time. And uh, so I, like, I didn't know you were, uh, into ceramics and that's kind of cool my dad uh, in his retirement has has taken on ceramics and it's a big passion of his I love I love it I wish I could still do it but it it's such a I can do small ceramics actually with my heat treat oven but um, if something was to explode which does happen when you're doing ceramics uh, stuff explodes and you can destroy a kiln pretty easily doing that and that would be a pretty big loss to destroy <laughs> so someday maybe maybe when i get my my big workshop in the mountains there you go but i'm i'm happy to answer any questions anyone else has um or we can just sit back and i'll let you guys you know bs and i'll just eat chicken <laughs> my cousin made me a ceramic mug and sent it to me and i don't i don't drink coffee so i thought well i'll I'll use it for my beer. So I put it in the freezer and got it nice and cold, and put a beer in, enjoyed one or two. And then, nice. then I went to pick it up and it, the, the, <laughs> the handle broke off. I mean, it broke, oh. smashing about a million pieces. I went, oh man, bummer. I guess it's freeze a ceramic mug, huh? <laughs> Well, and that's the crazy that thing about ceramics. Live. The firing, the firing process has a lot to do with that too. And the real, uh, every piece operates a little bit differently. <laughs> yeah, there's a uh, mug while it lasted. <laughs> there's a, a type of firing called raku, and you do wood chips and uh, like uh, paper, or you can do it with other like dried like hay and stuff. And it's a Japanese style where you you basically heat up the pot or the piece that you're working on and you put that piece hot in the can, in the garbage can filled with all the, you know, organic material and you close the lid and it just fires, like it lights everything else on fire in it and just keeps cooking it and gets hotter and hotter and you pull it out and it's just black and it's, it's a gorgeous way to do it. Um, it's just not durable at all. Like it, it's not a durable clay because you didn't really hit a certain cone level when you were firing it. So anyway, there's so much to it. Ceramics is a funny business because the guys that are actually making a lot of money are either really, really, really fast and they're making plateware and like China, or they're just making 
art stuff and they happen to have a really good following. There's really not a whole lot in between. Chris, are you hey, still uh, doing Chris, any? Chris, this is Sunbear John. Go ahead. Hey, yeah. Chris, this is Sunbear John. I mentioned, I mentioned something to, uh, to David. Uh, we really need a uh, virtual pipe club edition bones. Are you open to something like that? Completely. Yeah, if we get enough people involved, I, I don't know what the what the, the reach of this group is in totality, but uh, yeah, I mean, if you if you get something together, I can, uh, what I'll do is, this is kind of how I handle it. I'll let you guys on, on the forum or on, on Facebook come to your own conclusion on design and give me maybe two or three different styles that the guys are interested in and, you know, contact me and, and we'll pick the one that's doable or a couple that are doable. You can vote on it, whatever you want. I'll, I'll have it run with the, whatever logo you guys choose. And that's, that's totally doable for sure. Maybe, that maybe a good idea. Thanks. The good idea is maybe I will like read even and okay. everybody can put their thought in it. Maybe that makes sense. Perfect. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I think it would be fun. It's uh. I'm trying to think this group doesn't have any overhead, right? So there's no, it's, it's, there's not, not really any issues with uh, a certain uh, price point that has to be at to maybe pay into the club to create t-shirts or, or anything like that. So, I mean, I could even treat it like a, a discount, you know, deal a, a, like a wholesale deal and, and give you guys a discount. So it wouldn't even be as expensive. Right. Sounds great. Tim, I have a question for you. So I missed something from uh, your stuff in our trading post. Say that again. Uh, I missed some stuff from your in our trading post. So we talked about oh. last, last oh, time. Oh, oh <laughs> yeah. Ha ha haven't gotten around to that yet. How do you, how do you uh, is that on the website, Oliver? Yeah, of course. It's a permanent announcement. So you can put your stuff inside whatever you you like to sell and uh, go for it. Cool. Thank you. Thank you for You're reminding welcome. me to do that. Yeah. Oliver, where are you located? Um, I'm near Chicago, Chicagoland. So I'm uh, Aurora Naperville area, but originally I'm from Germany. Cool. No, I, I knew I, 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 I sensed the German. I just, because I, I work a lot with uh, actually quite a few German retailers. And I was thinking maybe he's in Germany. He could tell me kind of what, <laughs> what it looks like over there right now. <laughs> <laughs> Are you a member of the Chicago group, Oliver? What was it? Are you a member of the Chicago Pipe Group? No. The Chicago Land Pipe Group? No. No. I have so much stuff to do with this uh, virtual pipe club seven days a week, so oh, I'm, okay. not open. I'm not open for everything else. And Chris, I'm glad to hear you're a big fan of Lane and Dulo, like myself. I love it. It's and it was a shocker when I mentioned it the first time because people thought that, you know, because of uh, my my particular place place in the business doing like you know the handmade pipes and everything. Everyone was like, "Oh, he probably smokes like the really aged Virginias." I was like, "No, I like, I really really love Lane and Duyo. And then that was a shock. But then when I came on and said I like the Captain Black grape, people were getting ready to disown me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 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 cur I'm gonna be experimenting with their own version of Lane and Dulo, trying to blend oh, something cool. similar. Cool. Yeah, I think. Um, well, I'm not gonna give away any spoilers, but I think that that blend can be made better with higher grade cigar leaf. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking too. Yeah. I've I've got some Dominican sources that I'm looking at right now. Cool. I'd like to uh, share one of my sun bear experiences. You know, uh, I always smoke in my car and uh, on the way to work and whatnot. And uh, you know how, like, if the next day you come into your car, depending on the tobacco you smoked the day before, it could smell kind of lousy. I stepped into my car after sun bear and it was awesome. I mean, just a great smell in the car. It's honey. Oh, it's perfect. That's one blend. I feel bad saying it because it's a personal preference. It's one blend that I just can't, I can't get on board with for some reason. I I have a bunch of tins here, and I'll I'll go back to my one open tin every once in a while. And I think it's, 
I think it's the honey. I think for some like I love honey. I collect honey, which is another weird thing about me. But it just has such a it's a different thing. Maybe it's because I don't like sweetness. I'm one of the weird people that doesn't like dessert. Like I'll have I'll have like an apple for dessert. <laughs> Chris, I mean, have you, uh, oh, go ahead. Chris, have you uh, gone back to uh, or thinking about going back to uh, Missouri Meerschaum as far as any of the uh, collaborations you did with them? There is something still in the works. I've been trying to get the uh, the Cobb cigar back online because there there were a few little design elements that needed to be changed. Uh, again, with the variables, uh, the Cobb cigars or the cobs were drying further after we were drilling them and then the stems wouldn't hold. So we're trying to find a way to sort of literally bridge the gap and make everything cohesively work. But the thing from, is with, with, uh, with yeah, with Phil's, Missouri Mearsham though, they, they take, what's that, Will? Oh, I said Phil's going to be a guest on here following you in a few weeks so oh cool yeah and, uh, you guys awesome aren't guy, related yeah. are you you got the same last name no 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 he's uh <laughs> he's 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 a i i actually looked and i see i mean morgan is such a common name though i mean yeah it's, i know <laughs> but i did check because my first you could, you could be <laughs> my first introduction to him, yeah it's maybe somewhere down the line you never know i mean but uh, the Cobb cigar will be coming back at some point. I don't know if we'll have another RC Cobb because it, it's a great undertaking. It's very yeah. expensive to make. Uh, it's a lot of work. I mean, it's an insane amount of work. You have to like see how these guys do what they do. I mean, it, it's an assembly line. It's a very old school assembly line way of doing things. Um, you got you know, guys on lathes and they're just spinning off the cobs, like getting the shapes. You have one person that plugs in the shank. You have one person that does the plaster. And I mean, it's, it's impressive how quickly they can work. Cause I mean, at the end of the day, they're selling more pipes than any other, probably any other person on the planet. I mean, they do one last time I checked 1.25 million pipes a year. Chris, I have a question I, I, for you about I think you are uh, I'm sorry, about your Briar cigars. So where came this idea from? And I know that Fowen in Germany make this kind of Briar cigars for years, and it comes from the 20s, I would say. It's, it's, a, it's not a new thing, it's an old thing. So where's the difference between yours and maybe the stuff from Fowen? So Fowen, uh, their Zeppelin mm -hmm. is probably what you're referencing. Yes. I, I got one a long time ago and I just couldn't, I, I couldn't smoke it. I couldn't get behind it. It didn't smoke well to me. Um, and I, I, I kind of forgot about it for a while. And I thought, you know what, what if I was again, like how everything else comes about, I, I wanted to play around with some ideas and decided that uh, we'll see, you know, how can we, how small can we make a cigar shaped pipe? Can we do like a cigar cigarette or a, cigarette pipe kind of thing and the original briar cigars were actually really small and they didn't smoke well and i've gotten input from a lot of people over the years uh specifically mimo uh, uh the people at alpasha in italy and various others have kind of dropped in little bits and pieces like why don't you try this why don't you try that and bring them together uh, in the shop, the way that I did, and, and we did actually a lot of uh, scientific testing on, on uh, fluid dynamics and, and thermal, you know, I don't know all the terms, I'm not that much of a scientist, but the way that the RC chamber has to be positioned, and how much of that volume do you need in that chamber, uh, we ended up coming up with, I say we, but the later part was kind of just me tinkering around with it and finalizing it. Uh, I came up with a, a design that worked, and it performs well and you would think that it would it would be the walls would be so thin that they would burn out but it's actually so thin that the walls never get hot enough to burn it's a really weird 
uh, thing. But there's there is something coming out soon that will put all those worries to bed permanently. I got a, a new style Briar cigar coming out as well. I was wondering, I, I watched a lot of uh, YouTube videos about the Zevelin from Faun, and nobody on YouTube uh, was uh, trying to, to smoke it right. So everybody has an issue with that stink. So uh -huh. I don't know. So and I it, probably it's not, wasn't. It's, it's, not, it's not cheap. It costs, I don't know, 250 like, bucks or something. Yeah, it's yeah. like two, 300 bucks. It's, yeah. it's not a cheap pipe. Right. Um, it's probably expensive to manufacture in retrospect. I mean, there's a lot of parts and there's threading and all kinds of stuff, but it just wasn't, um, it, it wasn't an obvious design for me when I was, when I was working on mine, it just, it, it was a very different thing. You know, it's the, the sparkless pipe and why it's called the Zeppelin was for use on Zeppelins because it was sparkless. There wasn't any actual exposed heat element. So you could, <laughs> hypothetically, smoke it on a Zeppelin and you wouldn't ignite the hydrogen and create the Hindenburg problem again. Um, but I think that was more a marketing stance than an actual practical application for the pipe. But I, I guess it comes from the 20s or 50s. So it's, it's yeah. pretty old. 20s. There's actually, there's even patents that I had to, I had to battle against that were even older than that that showed various pipes that uh, were patented in the late 1800s that were kind of cigar shaped. There, there were patents that they threw back at me because I fought it for about six years and I finally was awarded the patent, uh, I think four years ago, five years ago, something like that. And uh, so they would rebuttal and they would show silly things like they would show a pipe that was made out of uh, ceramic right? And it would have this cage and it would sit like this on a cage, like a, a stand, uh, like a thing. And it would have a candle underneath it. And you put the tobacco in and it would heat up the bottom and somehow burn the tobacco from the bottom up. And it, it had all these weird, they had all these crazy inventions that people had made over the years because back in the day, even in like the sixties, if you wanted a patent, you went down to the patent office you filed your patent, you got a patent like a month later. Now it's, you're lucky if you get out of there within like five years, three years. I mean, it, it's a very long process and it gets, it gets really, really expensive to the point where many times I kept thinking, do I want to double down again? Like it was, at, it was like I was in Vegas, like double, should I double down or walk away and lose all my money? You know, it's, it's a very strenuous process. Hey, Chris, what do you think about a Meerschaum cigar? I've done it. You have? I, I ha yeah, yeah, I had some. Um, I had to pack a... <laughs> this is neither here nor there, but when we we almost received a, uh, a fire evacuation warning a couple weeks ago, so I went through my shop. That's why I didn't have much stuff to show you guys. I packed it all up in totes and put it in my garage in case we had to leave with everything. Um, that never happened, thank God. But uh, I could have shown you, I have, uh, I, I had some Turkish uh, Meerschaum carvers make some Meerschaum cigars. Uh, there were only maybe a dozen of them and they, they sold. I could do it again. They're really expensive though. Yeah, I can imagine. And the, there's almost no profit margin. Like the way that the pipe making market goes in Turkey is everything is roughly the same price. It's really strange. Um, if you want a pipe, it's like, you want to buy a pipe. Like if I want to just buy one, one for me, it's 110 Euro. If I want to buy a hundred to brand and resell, it's 110 Euro. It's, it's a really weird and there's no haggling. It's, there's no, like just, that's the price. So for me to resell that, it makes it a very expensive product. Chris, this is Aaron from Japan. Um, hey Aaron. I uh, was wondering, are, are bones available here in Japan? Because right now, because of COVID and the like, international shipping is just a mess. It is and, a mess. Um, I was just wondering, like, my interest is peaked, and I'd love to get my hands on bones. But I was just wondering, are they available in Japan? They are. Excuse me. It's a little complicated because uh, generally what happens is a lot of um, – 
the bigger groups of like Japanese pipe smokers, there's, there's sort of groups on Facebook and stuff and they will buy, they'll do a group buy and then have it shipped there. Um, there's really at the moment because of COVID, I'm trying to think if we have any retailers, there's Suge, but I don't think they carry, I don't think they carry bones. I think they carry the Briar Star. Right, right. Um, how are you able, are you able to get stuff from like Malaysia? Um, I'd have to check. I haven't tried to get okay. anything from, but uh, I'll, there, I'll, there's I'll... a group called Mampos, M A M P O S, mainly old, mainly main, no, what is it? Malaysian, no, mainly only Malaysian pipe smokers. I forget the, the moniker, but you he brings in some stuff from time to time. Uh, there's another guy called Acre. Acre a C R E Acre Dave Andretti, and he's in. Okay. Uh, where is he? He is in Indonesia. Okay. And I also have, from time to time, there's a Chinese retailer that'll pop up, and then they go away, and then a new one takes their place. It's kind of a, a shell shell game kind of thing with retailers, because it generally they'll they'll be a little more optimistic about their market or they'll be not as optimistic and they'll sell out. Like there's all kinds of weird trade things that happen in, in Asia for pipes made elsewhere. It's hard to explain. Right. That's a beautiful yard though, by the way. Thank you. Like I, I'm out here, I'm an organic rice farmer and I just finished harvest. So now I'm back to got time to work in my shop and making pipes again. So I would love to hear how you, went to that have you always done that uh this is my 12th year is doing organic farming there was a I, I was a monk in thailand back in the day and uh they talked about this crazy japanese farmer that did this something called natural farming mm -hmm. a guy named masanobu fukuoka who wrote a book called the one straw revolution kind of like the he's kind of like the guru like like i think the idea of permaculture and the like probably stemmed from him um okay anyways when book i was like i need to grow my own rice and so that's <laughs> rad been aaron i've been I've, I've been dying to find out how you wound up in japan doing what you're doing that i was thinking that must be an amazing story and i just got yeah. a little taste of it there um yeah i don't want to hog uh, waste other people's time but <laughs> we'll, yeah, we'll have one as a guest and you can tell the whole story yeah i want to hear it that's it's very interesting because it it uh I mean, I know quite a few people that you're like, what are you doing in this XX country, whatever it is? Like I know people in South Korea. I'm like, how did you get there? It's, what do you do there? Because they show all this beautiful landscape. I'm like, damn, okay. Yeah, I'll take you, like this is the garden here. Wow. I don't know if you, so it's Sunday morning, five o'clock this morning. <laughs> it was kind of an early. Um, yeah, it's just a beautiful area. Like I, I live in Tokyo but I come out here on the weekends to do grow rice and make pipes. So is it warm and humid there? Oh yeah. <laughs> I don't know how I figured actually, that out. We actually got fall, you know, it's, we're, it's starting to feel a little bit like fall now, but like, Oh man, it was a brutal summer, especially in the rice patty. <laughs> so I might as well show you real quick since I'm out here. That's my rice patty. The rice patties over there. Wow. That, that gate in the background, that's like a 250 year old. That was like a samurai, like the samurai Lord. Um, I like that was the landowner. So all the far, the farmers in this area used to, all the rice used to go to that guy right over there. And you're fluent in, you're fluent in Japanese. You, I take it. Yeah. Respect brother. I've been here for like 20 years. Do you um, own, do you own the property? I, I, I only ask because I'm, I'm curious because in, in China, it's a little different. I, I actually know another guy that's a farmer out there and he, he, uh -huh. he like leases the land, but he technically owns it for a hundred years. Is it the same kind of process? Um, similar, like um, the, the patties that I'm using right now, um, I are owned by that, that the place that I just showed you, the old Samurai Lord family. And nobody's yeah. doing anymore. 
um like this this uh, area is just you know i i would say probably the average age is 70 years old um and wow. so what i do is i like weed eat for her because she's got she owns like those mountains. oops sorry all those mountains in the background is all her land and so she's got like so much weed eating to do so i just uh weed eat for her throughout the year and that's how i pay for the uh rent the land cool so that's very cool they're very interesting and you, do you sell it through a, a distributor or like a market what's that do you, do you sell the rice through a like a market or there's a wholesaler or how's that how's that work uh, because i'm i do organic and it's it's like i do like really it's all very labor intensive like it's old school so i've just got a niche mm -hmm. market i just do it um through facebook and the like and i don't know i sold out in two weeks this year like i don't yeah. know i'm able good for you roast excellent like the, the quality of rice is i've kind of got a good reputation now so like two weeks like i was able to move 400 kilos so whoa <laughs> you know i i, I know that uh, in, in japan rice takes on almost a um uh, 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 it's a spiritual thing almost if i'm not mistaken um so how were you accepted into that, that yeah that's an excellent question especially being as a foreigner and right. like even an american of all things you are yeah, american. right yes and so like even with it um even an hour and a half outside of tokyo um it's still like medieval times out here in terms of mentality in the lake. And so um, it took, let's see, I've been doing, this is my 12th, I got, no, it's 13 years. So I would say the first eight years was just busting, just, you know, working crazy hard and like doing volunteer, like helping out with whatever I could in the community. And then, um, Finally, yeah, I'd say in the past four years or so, I've been accepted in the community and I'm kind of, yeah, it just, um, that's yeah, crazy, was, man. That's wild. That's awesome. I, I, yeah. I, I, yeah. That's not an easy thing to do. That is not an easy barrier to overcome. I know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it, yeah, it's been. It's been an interesting process, that's for sure. And yeah, you're right. Like uh, rice is sacred in Japan. Like one of the the um, jobs of the for every year is to like plant rice for or, like the entire emperor system of the emperor was kind of started when rice was brought from, I guess China originally back in you know, I think it was like five hundred eight, you know the year 500 or something like that. And so once rice was established, that's when you started to get in the communities and that's where the like imperial family and the like started. So that's continues is like the, the emperor, if the emperor doesn't plant the rice at the beginning of the year, it's going to be a terrible year for rice is kind of the belief or the, um, yeah, I don't know. I, yeah, I'll be, <laughs> Sorry, I don't, this is Chris's time. Like my my apologies for hijacking hijacking. The no, time. it's it's not. It's no. That was we already did that for two hours. It's not the Chris show. I'm I'm eating. You guys talk. I'm just I'm super curious because I'm kind of where uh, <laughs> where Mr. Dwyer is on this because like being accepted as like a uh, a mainstay in a community like that is incredibly difficult. Like it's the, the thing that's. The thing I'm struggling now is being an American making pipes in Japan. So, um, <laughs> so I've got like one people that want to buy Japanese pipes. They want to buy it from people that are Japanese to get a Japanese pipe. And then similarly, like Japanese people that want to buy a foreign pipe don't want to necessarily buy a pipe by a foreigner in Japan. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, you're screwed either way. Like, when, they, like, when they when they buy a Harley Davidson in Japan, they want a Harley Davidson made in America, not in Japan. That's right. So, so uh, well, we'll see how the pipe making thing goes. We've still only been doing it for a couple of years, so we'll see how it goes. But no, it's not been a couple of years. I guess it's only been a year. So you have a couple of pipes you can show us? Sure. Actually, yeah, actually, I do. I was impressed with those tampers, man. Those tampers are awesome. The bamboo yeah, it's, tampers? Yeah, Todd, I'll get on that today. Like, <laughs> it's just been crazy with the getting the harvest in and the like. So it's been crazy uh, everywhere, man, the whole world over. Yeah, right. Um, I don't know. Like, um, I'm trying to grant, grow. I've got like, this is a really good plate, really good area for growing bamboo. And so, like, out back here, like, I don't know if you guys can see, like, my hand, I've got pretty big hands, and it doesn't even go right out of the diameter there. But, like, um, so I've started planting black bamboo and Buddha bamboo so that, like, I can incorporate those in my pipes. Um, and so I've been harvesting my, uh, harvesting my own bamboo out here as well. So a few examples. I don't know. I'm, I'm, that in and of itself is crazy, you know, that you would plant bamboo because here, you know, bamboo is something that we exterminate. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is. You find it, you kill it as quickly as you can before it takes over. All right. Yeah. Here's a couple, Actually, couple of examples. So right. you're digging up the roots, right, Aaron? Yep. Yeah. And so um, supposedly, like, I guess the best season to do that is like, November, December, from what I've been told, but. I love that so, knuckle, man. Nice, robust uh, knuckle. So those are examples of some bamboo. And then let's see. I don't know, like I'm, I'm still haven't got into like freehand and like I'm still kind of doing, so that's. Beautiful. I don't know. So I'm I'm still learning. Like you know, I've got just this little. I got my bandsaw, drill press, lathe, sander, and then like my French death, French, French sanding wheel. That's about. That's You're way further along than I was my first year. I have some <laughs> very serious workshop envy going on. I, I was lucky yeah. because um, in 2018 was the World Pipe Smoking Championship here in Tokyo. And I was one of the few people that could speak Japanese and English. So I was able to meet amazing pipe makers. Some, you know, like, I don't know. I was like, I'm not worthy. But um, I don't know. I've got... Uh, Became, I've become really close with Alex Floroff. And so um, I talk to him every weekend. And like he's, he's, he's kind of coaching me along through, um, yeah, he's just teaching me through over the internet. I was hoping to get there this summer, but that didn't like, yeah, international travel wasn't happening this summer. So you got to hit up uh, Keiichi Goto. Right, Goto, and then like um, he works with Tom, and then like Toku. Um, I I need to get out right now. Yeah. Um, I've got connections, and that's the other thing. The old Japanese um, pipe makers are very hesitant to teach the youth because they do it. Um, yeah, the old style, and they know that like a lot of the uh, you know a lot of their processes are like outdated, and so they don't want. To, yeah, they don't want to put people through that <laughs> is that is that kind of a a, a a guild thing an apprenticeship thing closed there, i think so yeah but um yeah that whole apprenticeship thing is a, a dying thing i think here in japan um because what an apprenticeship would mean i apprenticed as um, a tea ceremony gardener for about five years and 
you know, like the first three years I was just raking and sweeping and stuff. Like it's, you know, kind of the, <laughs> you know, kung fu type. Um, Sleeping on a bed of nails. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah, man. You know, wax on, wax off type stuff, mm -hmm. you know, like kind of like the karate kid type mm -hmm. uh, doing annual labor and stuff to get like before actually being able to like touch um, pruning shears and things like that. Um, so the whole concept is that you like live with the master and like, um, yeah, and there's no A and you just, you get a bed and it's just a long process. So, um, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know. I'm planning to go visit mm -hmm. Boku, but like with, because of COVID, um, and coming from Tokyo and he's, he's getting up there. He's like really elderly now. So he's. Um, that's what I was gonna say. I was I was surprised that you were able to that he he acquiesced because I based on his Facebook posts and stuff I I thought he w he wasn't feeling well lately. Yeah, but it, it, uh, his health actually during COVID um, his health has actually gotten better. Oh, good. Um, but yeah, it's still uh, yeah he still has some serious health issues. I mean, if you're gonna learn him and and uh, Goto or I mean that's that's top of the top of the cake right there. Those guys are insanely skilled. And like Sato, like um, Sato lives like probably within like ten minutes from me in Tokyo, but mm -hmm. it's not like different introductions and like it, it's it's a completely different world. Like you know, like I think I guess it's probably similar in this dates i'm not sure but like it seems the pipe makers in the states are a lot more open some of us <laughs> i mean it depends on who you talk to but like you know people send you an invoice and some people will give you free information it really depends on on who it is I, i'm of the school of thought globally that you can actually show someone in person how to do something and they still won't be able to replicate it and that's what makes that will make sure that's what makes your art form valuable. Like uh, it, to hearken it back to even like blacksmiths, blacksmiths all did the same thing. They all watched how they all did everything from time to time. Uh, their heat treatment method was like so crazy secretive that you would never see any bit of it ever. You would never see a blacksmith heat treat anything because right. that was their, that was their bread and butter. Um, and the guys that, made swords for kings you know it, it wasn't even about if you had money it was a nobility thing certain certain uh men would be uh they they would be of a level of status and notoriety to bear and to carry a certain weapon and right. if you if you were a peasant, you did not have a good sword unless you were a blacksmith, and then you made your own good sword. It's and, a, it's the same same way with with uh, with pipes and stuff. It's, and anyway. those those were the the, the trade secrets, uh, and that was the whole power behind the guilds. You know, the intellectual property rights. You don't want that information to get out. Exactly. Because then you got competition. And that's not good. Exactly. You I mean, I I I go ahead. Big the like. If you'll let me, uh, oh. if you, if you don't mind, I've got, uh, let's see, this is Edo period. So, wow. It's your about 150 year old. You're going to show us your katana. I am. Oh, I thought a monk, I would, he would never oh. learn katana. A no, he, he's, katana. He, he's American. So he's allowed to own one. Pulp Fiction, baby. Do you, you, you have, have to carry it. You have to have your license. There's the license right there. E it's even as... I Speak up Japanese again, citizens. Aaron. Sorry? Speak up again so we can see the license. Okay. Oh, so that's the license. Unbelievable. That's cool. And so that's always got to be with the sword. Like, um, yeah, the, yeah, it's... You'll be seriously... Yeah thrown in jail it's not it's not don't want to be caught without that so this blade comes from um this is the end of the bakumatsu so this is like during the transition of 
um, the feudal to um, from the shogun where, uh, where sorry where the shogun lost his power and the power went back to the emperor so um, probably 18 probably 1830 like around our civil war i think it was yeah yeah um so um okay so that, that's what but, but and so the it doesn't have I'm trying to figure out how to so normally when you have a katana you have something called the sorty which is like that beautiful round uh, it's got the curve curvature mm -hmm. whereas uh, the, the end of the bakumatsu, um, it was more of a thrusting, and so like the blades are a little bit straighter. So it's like the oldest, like the original, like katana was really curved because it was for on a horseback, and the idea was to like cut from um, the horse, and so it needed to be curved, and then slowly the curvature got less and less, and it this is probably the end of it so um yeah i don't know if we can see any detail in the like um, oh my god i'll turn the mic off so i'll unmute yeah sorry like that's not showing you much detail at all But that was like always a, a dream of mine was to own a katana. And so I stopped drinking alcohol, which was probably the best decision of my life, just because I couldn't, it was not a good thing for me. And after three years of not drinking, I was able enough to save enough money to buy a katana. <laughs> I just quit drinking. Did you? Just now. I want a katana. <laughs> Don't believe Todd. He'll always have that corn whiskey going on. I'm going to auction it off. Uh, so how long have you had that? And I got to ask, how much was it? Um, it was about 3000 No, That is no, no, amazing. No. Two, let's see. I think 2500 do you have to do anything to the blade? Do you have to do any, you know? Yes. Um, What's the maintenance? Was, seriously, if I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm hoping I'm, I really, if you guys want me to stop talking, I'll be glad to. But um, there is, so this is like a, So I do a martial art, which is called Shinkage Ryu, which is um, the old form of sword fighting. Like Kendo is more like offense, whereas I don't know if you all are familiar with Aikido, which is where you're kind of taking the offense and counterattacking, kind of just taking that um, person's um, power and redirecting it. That's the kind of sword fighting I do. So this is a typical sword cleaning kit. So this is what you would hold the blade with. Um, this is so the... You, so you did some classes to handle it right? Um, that... Yeah, that, or I just was taught by other people. So, for example, you've got your bamboo peg here. I might as well and that, well, this is really tricky to try and do with the camera. Sorry. Um, let me see if I can do this better. Sorry, guys. So the, the hilt here is um, held in just with a bamboo peg. Um, so you pull the peg out. Th 
this one, this is this one is probably a two hundred year old. This is what they call the wakizashi, which is the short sword. Um, yeah, this one, this one's actually more um, special than my regular one. So, yeah. There we go. So you never touch, you only ever touch the part that's held in the hilt. And like one of the things with the katana is that you have the sword maker's name on it. Um, this one I can't take out of Japan because it's considered um, uh, not national, national treasure, but um, it's a famous enough person that like, so first what you do is you wipe off the oil, Todd, then um, good thing I needed to do this. So then there's, this is made out of um, deer horn. It's like powdered deer horn that you, and this puts uh, a shine on the blade. Uh, the, and you never, you have different cloths for each of these processes because you don't want to mix. So at this point, after you get the deer horn um, <coughs> wiped off, that's as, as polished as it's going to get unless you take it to a wet stone. So at this point, that's where you have this cloth and that's when you hand it to somebody to take a look at and examine and the like. Um, and then the next step is before you put it away, you re-oil it. And um, this is, it's, they use clove oil, like oil from cloves. So you put that on. Talking about, you know, when you're talking about um, doing blacksmithing and how you have to be very careful and at the moment exactly know what you're doing. It's the same thing when you're cleaning your sword. <laughs> it's very I, easy I do see. that and I apply <laughs> clove. I, I use clove oil on my blades, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Aaron, you, you certainly know about this and I'm sure that Chris knows about it and I'm sure that Bart would too, that those katanas, especially for when they were made, they went through, through some crazy, crazy um, uh, uh, quality controls. Yeah. Right. By and, the, and, the, and the whole forging process, right? In terms of like bend, you know, like bend, folding the folding the steel. Yeah. The, the only the only culture to rival the Japanese in bladesmithing were uh, <clears throat> there were, well, there were a few Middle Eastern cultures that would create Wootz, uh, Wootz steel or Wootz Damascus, which is literally taking the iron ore bloom and processing that into a sword. And it was a very lengthy process. The Japanese would do it uh, in a slightly different fashion. The refining technique was a, a lot higher, but the, uh, their their base benefit was the steel itself. Whereas the, um, I forget what culture it was in Middle Eastern. It wasn't like Mesopotamian or anything. It was later than that, but their, their heat treating process was so impossibly complicated that uh, it created a grain structure that offered optimal flexibility and strength. And it's almost non, not duplicatable today by even modern technology, like it has to be done a very certain way, but the, I'm, this is a pleasure watching this. Also like even, even like the sword guards and stuff, the metal work on there, like this yeah. one I picked in particular cause it's got rice grain. I don't know if you can. That's you, cool. Um, is that a copper but, suba? No, no. It's iron. It's iron. Yeah. So you've got a set, you've got a long sword and a short sword. Yeah. So you got a long sword for your enemies and a short sword to fall on. 
Or if my enemies come inside, then I use the short sword. Yeah, right. All right. I had a bad <laughs> rice harvest. <laughs> <laughs> Fall on your sword. Fire upon my village. <laughs> Actually, we got a we have a lot of like um, wild boars in this area. So boar hunting I, with a katana. <laughs> no, we, we actually use spears. <laughs> like when we um we end up yeah, when we have to harvest the boars, we use the spears, which is kind of old school and kind of because we don't have guns here, obviously. So yeah. You can't you can't uh spear hunt boars here anymore. You used to be able to, but they don't allow it's it's very uh it's very, very bloody and violent. For the people that don't know what they're doing yeah so, yeah if you don't get it in the right place yeah, yeah. If you don't get it in the heart then it's not yeah it's not a pleasant experience in texas um, they use helicopters and ar-15s yeah <laughs> texas has different rules man yeah. Cali california a, we uh we don't allow to do anything <laughs> it's a sporting event in texas very sporting well they destroy um they destroy as a meat eater. I feel a certain way about it, but from a humanitarian aspect, it's a it's a bit brutal. But they they destroy billions of dollars of crops right. yeah. in Texas. They're insanely invasive. Um, yeah, that's the only reason that we yeah kill boars is because what they do to the rice patties and the other crops. And, and there's no and bacon. What's that? And and bacon. I mean, let's not forget bacon. Exactly. I got I got a freezer full of boar that needs to be made. And, and Chris. so, I, I've I've offered this to like other members. As soon as international travel is available again, this place is always open, and I love um, showing being tour guides for people in Japan. So if anyone ever wants to come smoke pipes in Japan and needs a place hey, to stay. Uh, Aaron. Aaron, I want to go to uh, Tokyo. Can you show me some uh, good sushi? I love sushi. Oh, yes. I definitely can. Sushi and pipe. I can do both. <laughs> I want to get some real genuine fugu. Yeah, for sure. Have, have you had fugu before? I have not. You know what? I, I did one time back in the 80s. There was this place in, in Campbell, Kamatsu, Harry. Harry Kamatsu, managed yeah, dude. <laughs> he, yeah, yeah. Harry managed to have some of that shit smuggled in. Yep. And uh, I, he had a, I think it was his daughter who, you know, had some dry ice and brought it over. And it, it, it was like New Year's Eve or something. And we had an after party there. Yeah. That's funny. Man. I haven't been to Komatsu in years. I don't even know if it's there anymore. It's probably not. We we actually just had Water Tower Kitchen, which is over in Campbell, and it was that's what I was just eating right now was a leftover fried chicken, and it was ridiculously good. It's it's funny because I used to back in the eighties when I was uh, before I was teaching, you know, I we would do boar hunting back in uh, you know Colinga Mineral Springs, Hunter Liggett back in there. Uh, we used to I used to take it to Los Gatos Meats. Mm -hmm. I have 25 pounds of boar and 25 pounds of Jimmy Dean's uh, hot sausage, and those guys would grind it for me. Um, yeah, this is crazy, man. I, I got a pipe uh, guy in Los Gatos, got a pipe guy in Japan, the monk with the katana. Technology. <laughs> Technology. Hey, Aaron, do you see many pipe, pipe smokers in Japan? No. No, like, um, and the pipe clubs in Japan are very, it might just be I'm in Tokyo too. Like Tokyo is not a very friendly city per se, because you've got, um, it's people all over Japan have come and gathered in Tokyo. So there aren't many actual Tokyo people in Tokyo. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's the pipe clubs that I've seen in Tokyo are like really elitist. Um, I do have a group of guys, I don't know what's, you know, we haven't got together for six months or more than that now. Um, but like every Friday night, we would get together and share tobacco and show like, 
they've got some beautiful pipes like some of these japanese guys have got some amazing amazing pipes and i pretty much me i just i always roll in try and bring whatever the best tobacco i have and i've all got my factory pipes i'll look forward to bring a bone someday yeah that'd be <laughs> fun you might hey if you're looking for a new business you can be an importer you can retail them in japan i'm open to whatever really yeah oh let me um i'm really good friends with um ryota who's the representative mm -hmm. for pipes in japan here and mm -hmm. uh he probably has a let me br l brainstorm with him like i don't sure. know in terms of mm -hmm. license stuff that i will need but um yeah that would be awesome yeah i mean i'm i'm always open to that kind of stuff because it's <clears throat> within this country i have retailers because it gives me visibility in other countries i have retailers mainly because it's easier for the customer like right. i have a distributor that takes care of all of europe except for the uk which is mine um and i can deal directly with that but i was doing all of it by myself for a long time and i was dealing with italy and germany and all these places and it, it gets to a point where it's almost impossible to manage every single person because every shop has a different owner and every owner has a different personality right. and having to deal with every single personality and their preferences and everything is just, it's exhausting. So, um, and the other thing is having people stateside in these countries, uh, you know, who are from the area, they know the people, they're able to market in a different fashion. Japan works so differently than like Indonesia, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, a lot of Southeast Asia, those countries are extremely trend based. So if one guy gets something and another guy sees it and he wants it, and then like 15 other people see it, it creates this like amazing boom, but then the boom stops and then you don't hear anything for like six months until the next guy gets it. Uh, so it's, it's, it's hard to keep all those in check, but yeah, it's, I'd be interested. Let me know. Awesome. Um, yeah. I, yeah. Okay, cool. Like, and th th that's the great thing about this venue, this, this type of a pipe club, um, you know, just since I've been on here, I've 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 gotten uh, one of your bones. I got uh, 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 <laughs> Kareem Abdul's um, Algerian Briar. You know, I I never would have heard of this guy. You know, uh, 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 Janos Kakinos. I I found one of his. I I'm waiting for it in the mail. This stunning, stunning piece of Briar with this bird's eye, like I've never seen before. So, you know, and then you guys make a connection and you got bones in Japan. It's great. Yeah, you post you posted a picture of that Yano's pipe and like that bird's eye. It's gorgeous. I, I, I sent that guy. I saw that. Bang. I don't need another pipe for Christ's sake. That's the last thing I need. But it's one of those things where you see it and you got to have it. And yeah. uh, I emailed him right away. Hey, man, is that thing for sale? Yeah, it's for sale. And uh bang just got it on the spot i was so lucky i can't wait to get that thing Yanos is a funny guy too he's got a cool personality he's he's like the crazy artist you know so he would we would he would always chime in on certain certain chats or like uh i forget where it was we i first talked to him but like he's he's always he's always working always working like it's just it's so funny hey uh chris yes yeah, sir do you know Jody Davis? I don't know him, no. Actually, we've never spoken, but uh, I've followed his work for the entirety of my career. <laughs> All right, I'm trying to trying to find somebody that knows him, and maybe he might be interested in uh, speaking here with us. Uh, you could contact him through Jeff Grasick, probably. They're, okay. from what I understand, they're pretty good friends and, and Jeff is, is fairly responsive to email. I know Jody is, Jody is crazy busy. Um, I know he's crazy busy. He's he always travels very tremendously. Busy. Yeah, he's always yeah. on the road. So I, I, the, I think Jeff is probably your best bet. Okay, thank you. Yeah, or send him an email. You know, I had kind of yeah. a layman's question that I didn't want to ask during the regular meeting because I was like, 
you know, I always feel like I'm kind of buttoning in and hogging in there, but uh, Aaron, you've got a shop and you make pipes and Chris, you've got your shop. And I'm just curious, would either of you, or do you think there are any applications for 3D printing? I don't know. I mean, would you benefit from a 3D printer in any form, anything to do with pipe making? I, I don't like the idea of plastic and burning, you know, like in terms of having anything hot next to plastic. You know, I know we use a, it, yeah, I'm still learning with acrylic. I've, I've been using only like ebonite, but like it's a very expensive learning curve when you screw up like a rock, like it's kind of painful. Yeah. Um, yeah. and so I try, I think you, I think, I think you could probably do stems with 3d printing, but I'm not sure about what else. Well, I, maybe, maybe, maybe that's the thing is, uh, uh, could you use vulcanite or acrylic? I don't know in a 3d printer. No, no, uh, ac acrylic. Yes. Possibly uh, certain kinds, uh, Ebonite, definitely not, because yeah. the, the way ebonite works is it's kind of a weird thing. Ebonite is a very old material, or vulcanite is, so it's just vulcanized plastic or vulcanized rubber, but there's a content of sulfur in this natural rubber compound, and as soon as you heat it, really, if you do nothing, it oxidizes on its own, right? But if you mm -hmm. heat it and you separate the sulfur molecules from the rubber, you basically delaminated those those uh, bonds and it doesn't perform the same. So really high end extruded um, ebonite is different than like casted ebonite. So casted ebonite it'll turn yellow overnight if it if it gets too wet or whatever. But the real expensive ebonite the stuff Aaron was talking about is the bonds are much tighter. The tolerances of of temperature and 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 speed at which it's processed is is very tightly controlled. But if, I think if you put that through, and this is purely theoretical, but if you put it through a heated stylus or, or whatever, you know, the nozzle is that does the printing, I would assume that it would delaminate those bonds and you would end up with probably a bastardized version of ebonite. Right. Um, there are resins that you could probably use, but I, to answer your question, I don't, you can make pipe stands. You can make mm -hmm. pipe stands with a 3D printer pretty easily. Yeah, I mean, there you I'm, go. Hey, uh, hey, Chris, what about uh, carbon fiber? I know carbon fiber is often used in 3D printing. Uh, I'm not familiar with how carbon fiber is done. I, I've seen metal done before, and then there's a whole like sintering process, or maybe I'm not getting the right word right. But uh, carbon fiber is funny because uh, it's actually one of the most innate materials, right? It's just carbon. But if you breathe in a shred of carbon, it can create uh, massive problems uh, in your lungs. And in fact, a funny story, I bought one of the original uh, L-Tank Sabre pipes, like the Popeye pipe, as it was called back a while ago. And it had a carbon fiber stem and I never smoked it because I was worried about maybe somehow getting some of that carbon fiber in my lungs. <laughs> so it's, right. I don't, I don't know enough Seriously, about it. Pipe, but... I know he uses a series of pipes that uh, uses the carbon fiber bank, kind of like his takeoff on, on Falcon pipes. And I, I think yeah. he uses carbon fiber in some of those for the chain. The, uh, his, his new one that he came out with, I'm trying to remember the name of uh, Basic, the Basic line. Yeah. Those, I have a carbon fiber stem, but I think the, the process has developed to a point that it's he's not using the same material he used to. I think before he was using more of a generic carbon fiber tube, and now it's like a finished carbon fiber piece. Uh, because it is, I mean, carbon fiber is a fabric, right? right? So you have to finish it or else it'll fray like a blanket, I would assume. Um, and I think mm -hmm. there's something to that part of it. It's, it's stabilized and encapsulated probably. Right, makes sense. I don't know Chris, enough about it, so I, I'm not the right guy to ask. <laughs> Chris, we're talking about stamps. What do you think about uh, P lips stamps like uh, P doesn't have? So I love it, but I heard you need a special machine to create this, this kind of stamps. Is that correct? 
Yeah, you can do it by hand. I mean, it's I've, I've made one P-Lip stem for a customer. Uh, I mean, it wasn't a P-Lip, it was a stem like a P-Lip. <laughs> um, but although, I mean, anything can be done if you have the tooling, it, 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 but in mass, it requires the, the, the machine, obviously. Uh, I bought, I'm not gonna say anything against this company, but I bought a Sherlock and I personally didn't enjoy how it was finished. So I never ended up getting a chance to smoke it. So all the Petersons that I have are all fishtails. Um, I've always wanted a really high end Peterson but I'm kind of waiting for the quality to increase before I get something new because it, it uh, I mean, that, that was, I think that was a good purchase on Laudisi's part to, to sort of take control over that operations and increase the quality. I just, uh, I haven't seen anything new and at the base of all of this, and I, I'll have to put this disclaimer out. I don't buy pipes. Like I really don't. I think I may have ever purchased from like a pipe shop, five pipes, ever. Um, most of the stuff I get is like maker trades. So it's not as prevalent now, but back when we were all, a lot of us were on the same learning uh, level, we would just trade amongst each other and learn from each other's mistakes or, hey, I really like how this works. I'm gonna use that too. But then as time went on, some guys really rose to the top and their work got really expensive. And some guys, you know, stayed at that, price point that we were all at and some guys quality was uh lesser or greater or whatever so there's no real maker trades with the people that i came up with unfortunately uh 